Week 10 in college football means we get the first action on the field following the unveiling of the initial college football playoff rankings. And on today's show, we're going to talk about two of those big games with our special guests, Mike Frank of IrishSportsDaily.com. He's the publisher, and he knows everything about Notre Dame football. Ryan Aber and Scott Wright will also join me from the Oklahoman to talk Bedlam. We'll go over the key injuries, odds, trends, and picks for the rest of Week 10's best in college football as the Arlette's Football Network on Prime Sports Network starts now. Is it all right, it's a Friday, the 3rd of November, 2017. I'm your host, Greg DePama, and we've got a really great show for you today. Uh, last week, we told you how it was the best weekend in college football, and it really did turn out to be that way. A bunch of key games. Of course, the Ohio State-Penn State was the biggest one of all. A lot of implications for the first playoff polls that came out. Of course, I talked a lot about them on Monday's show, OFN show. Uh, when I looked at the rankings, I was uh, starting to feel a little bit uneasy about what I'd see as far as the playoff rankings were concerned. But you know what? I got to give credit to the to the committee at this point. I think they did a good job so far. So uh, I'm, a, I'm actually a bit surprised. Yes, uh, you know how I feel about the committee based on what happened last year in the playoffs. Uh, but hey, for them to put Oklahoma ahead of Ohio State, that shows a lot of guts. Uh, there's still a long way to go, though. Teams have got to keep winning games. So it's a lot of fun, and let's go ahead and get started and talk, uh, first of all, Notre Dame football. By the way, we're going to talk Oklahoma at 2.30, Oklahoma State at 3 o'clock, and all the way in between, everything else going on in college football today. So let me introduce my first guest. He's the publisher of irishsportsdaily.com, Mike Frank. Uh, Mike, thanks for doing this. Sure, Greg. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, Mike. So uh, did you, uh, first question, did you uh, at this point in time envision on this date that Notre Dame could be number three in the polls for the playoffs? Uh, well, it depends on when you ask me. You know, if you would have talked about the beginning of the season, I would have said absolutely not. Uh, but if you would have asked me last week, I thought there'd be a chance. Um, you know, I think I think the thing that was kind of a little bit, uh, I don't know, it's the thing that concerned me the most, I guess, was Notre Dame just has not performed well on the big stage when they've had opportunities in the recent past. So I thought maybe some of that might hurt them, but I knew that they've played a pretty tough schedule. Uh, I know that they've pretty much dominated everybody other than Georgia. And, you know, Georgia was certainly a very good football team, and, and that's turned out to be the case, you know, as the season has unfolded. So yeah. for me, I was pretty pretty surprised. I thought they'd probably, you know, slotted about five when it was all said and done. Uh, but uh, I'm sure – Three's a, a great number for all Irish fans, for sure. Yeah, and, and and even the USC game. I know USC had been struggling going into that game, but the fact that they were able to beat them up the way that they did had to also be, uh, it had to also feel pretty good. Uh, because I don't, I even though I liked them in that game. Uh, I really wasn't sure what I was going to see because, like you said, we have seen them fail before in these big spots or in these marquee matchups. Uh, so when they were able to beat up USC, I think that really meant a lot. It did. It did. And you can see the confidence of this team growing. You know, a lot of people said after SC, well, you know, their defensive line was banged up. And then, sure enough, the very next game they played, North Carolina State, who has one of the best defensive lines in the yeah, country, and they right. run for over 300 yards against that group as well. So, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, a lot of Irish fans have been saying for years, if you want to play winning football in Notre Dame, you got to have a great run, uh, running game and a great ground game. And so, uh, you know, we've had guys like Charlie Weiss come in and try and throw it all over the field. And I think Brian Kelly tried to do a lot of that in the early part of his tenure here at Notre Dame. But yeah. I think he learned a hard lesson that, you know, if you want to win football in the Midwest and you want to win football at Notre Dame, you got to be able to pound the football. And uh, finally they're doing it and, and we're seeing the great success that they're having. Yeah, I think, and, and maybe coaches too need to start looking about the success. There's, there's no team, there's no program that has more success than Nick Saban over at Alabama. And he has a very simple formula. You play great defense, run the football, pro style old fashioned offense and why not play like that it's a winning formula well it is it's, you know what's really hurt Notre Dame over the years is you know they they could move it between the 20s but once they'd get into the red zone they couldn't score uh, they didn't have the ability to to be multi-dimensional down there where you had to be very afraid of their running game but also afraid of their passing game you add that running game into it and if you look at Notre Dame's red zone stats they're 
just ridiculous. They're extremely efficient, and it's because they can run the football. And so that's the difference between scoring, you know, 25 points a game and, and 40 points a game. When you can finish uh, with seven points versus three, it's a huge difference in the game. Uh, talk about Josh Adams, because I know uh, coming into this year, I was I mean, I, I know he hasn't been on the stage that he's uh, even been on this season or, or about to be on if this team keeps winning. And uh, I, just watching him play, even though it wasn't like he rushed for 2000 yards or anything like that. But just watching him play, he just he he, he just seems like such a, a, a fluid athlete, like he does everything so easily in his motions. And and that just intrigued me so much with his abilities. And now that the team is having so much success and he's a major part of it, he just does. He, the more I see him, the more special of a player I think he is. And you've seen a lot of uh, Notre Dame running backs over the years. How does he compare? You know, we just had this discussion on our website. And I personally think he's one of the very best running backs they've ever had, if not the best. Uh, you know, the thing about Josh Adams that, that has really improved is – is health. You know, he's been banged up. He came to Notre Dame with a knee injury and it took him a little bit to, to kind of get back from that. And then he got hurt again. Last year he was hurt uh, almost the entire season until the last two games. And if you look at what he did against Virginia Tech and, and USC in a terrible loss, I mean, he still rushed for almost 200 yards in an ugly loss against USC last year. So this the thing about Josh Adams is he is such a great runner uh, with balance. He just has fantastic balance. And, you know, all the great running backs have the ability to yeah. take these little hits and still stay on balance. And he's tremendous that way. And I think what he's really improved, too, uh, he's got a nice jump cut that he's developed over the last couple of years that I think is going to help him when he gets to the next level. And, and uh, he, he doesn't look as fast as... Maybe some people think he is, but I'm telling you, this kid can outrun a lot of people. He's a lot faster than people look. Think yeah. he is. Problem is, he's you know six two, and so yeah. tall guys don't look as fast running as as short guys. No, that that's exactly like that's just a different way of saying exactly what I was trying. My point that I try to tell listeners about Adams is he he's just so deceiving looking in his style in his running style. You just don't realize how good he is, and he makes it look easy. And uh, boy, this uh, th th a lot of big games coming up next week. Wow. I mean, I'm not so sure because with everything else going on, that people are, are paying attention to the fact that we might have ourselves an incredible Notre Dame-Miami matchup next week. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. You know, they, they play Virginia Tech at home this weekend, Miami does, and that's always a, a classic battle. So we'll see what happens with that. But, you know, this could be quite a game between <laughs> two, two uh, I guess, programs that really don't like each other. So this is going to be a really interesting thing. And, and uh, Miami, you know, lost to Notre Dame last year where they were one of the only four wins that they had. Uh, I think Miami felt like they were the better team, just didn't play better. And uh, so I'm sure they're going to be motivated and want to win this game. But again, you know, I'm just not sure too many teams. I think there's maybe three teams in the entire country that may have a chance to slow down run Notre Dame's running game. And that's Alabama, Georgia, and potentially Ohio State. I think Ohio State's got a pretty good defensive line, and they showed that. So, uh, you know, if it comes down to Notre Dame-Miami, uh, i got to figure Notre Dame's going to win that game just because of their offensive line. And really the surprising thing that people really aren't talking about and probably should be is the defensive play of Notre Dame. Yes. Uh, you know, nobody expected them to play this well, and – no matter who they play, they've they've done a tremendous job of shutting them down. Yeah, I, I just started talking about that a couple of weeks ago and pointing out what a great job uh, that uh, new defensive coordinator um, uh, Mike Elko uh, has done. And, and now you've got the matchup. Wake Forest, Wake Forest and Notre Dame. And he's been big. He has been big. This is the, the more they keep playing this type of defense, this kind of defensive, uh, uh, this, this kind of defensive production, the bigger uh, his name is going to start to surface. There's no question. This guy is an outstanding defensive coordinator. If you would have watched this team play last year, I mean, you know, they, they had the worst fundamentals uh, out of anybody I've ever seen. They constantly missed tackles and uh, constantly out of place and, and uh, blown assignments and all kinds of things that were going wrong. And it's, you know, he's a magician how he's been able to uh, get this group to play such sound, fundamental football, take away the football. You know, they're leading uh, the country in takeaways and, and, and points off of takeaways. And so, 
it, you know, it's been amazing to watch. And more important, I think, is he's taken a bunch of guys that you really kind of questioned uh, whether they really wanted to be great football players. Mm. And boy, if you watch them this year, they definitely want to be great football players. And they're playing uh, with tremendous amount of confidence. You know, and I think the thing that really stands out to me about this defense is if you watch football a lot, as, as the year goes on, especially late in November, you know, teams get banged up. And that's when, you know, the little bruises and, and, and poles and sprains start to really impact fundamentals of yep. football. Yep. And he, uh, this group, is still tackling at a very strong level and doing a very good job in the fundamentals, and that's why they're having so much success. Well, Niles Morgan is uh, Dan Shanka uh, at our lads. He has his brochure out, his early 2018 NFL Draft brochure out, uh, and uh, he's got Niles Morgan right now uh, early rated as his 11th rated senior inside linebacker. Uh, is Morgan, in your mind, the top uh, pro prospect on defense? I don't think so. No, I really don't. I think Jerry Tillery is probably the best player they have. And you're going to watch. It'll be interesting to see. You know, a lot of people don't know a lot about Jerry Tillery, uh, but he's, you know, six foot six, 320 pounds. He can play. He's quick enough to play the three technique, but he's playing nose now. Uh, you know, Jerry's probably the one guy that, you know, I was just mentioning. It, did he want to be a great player? Well, if you watch him play this year, he's just playing outstanding. Probably the best I've seen a, a Notre Dame defensive lineman play consistently in a very, very long time. And so what's going to happen is all these draft guys are going to start watching Notre Dame and watching the tape, and, and this guy is going to keep showing up time and time again, and, and it'll be interesting. I think he's going to have a decision to make. You know, when you're six six three twenty, and you can bend and move and, and uh, get small – and you have some quickness, you know, that's that's something that's very coveted in the NFL. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he enters the draft early. But, again, I'd say Jerry Tillery right now. Uh, I think Julian Love is a corner. He's only a sophomore, but I think he's going to be uh, a tremendous talent. Um, you know, and it'll be interesting to see with a, a guy like Drew Tranquil, who's playing their rover position, kind of a hybrid outside linebacker safety position. Okay. This kid is a dynamite football player. Might be kind of a tweener, but you know, you, as you notice, the NFL is going a little bit smaller. That's right. Uh, and they're looking for speed guys. This guy plays a tremendous uh, football at the line of scrimmage, but can also cover. And uh, you know, he's six foot two, probably two hundred and twenty-five pounds. So um, he's got a good enough body, I think, to make it in the NFL. Very smart football player. Um, so I'd say those guys, okay. you know, would probably be guys to be looking out for. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on Tranquil with that. With the, of course, uh, right now the NFL with the hybrid safety linebacker position uh, becoming prominent. Uh, maybe that is the ty a type of role that he could fit at the next level. Uh, McGlinchey, by the way, is uh, our lad's number one rated senior offensive tackle. So, uh, what about McGlinchey? Uh, what, what kind of a season do you think that he's had? Is 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 he playing uh, as as well as uh, you would like to see him play? Uh, you know, how about his matchups uh, against some of the better players that he's taken on so far this year? Well, they've you know they've definitely gone against some great uh, pass rushers in this this season, and I I wouldn't say you know he's not Ronnie Stanley. He's not a guy that's going to be able to move and and be the you know the prototypical uh, you know wall of defense in in pass rush. You know he's he's a very solid player in pass rush. Uh, but what he is is a dominating tackle in the run game. You know, I think he's probably going to be more of a right tackle in the NFL mm -hmm. just because of his size and his physicality. And he is an absolute dominating <laughs> offensive lineman. And, and uh, so in that regard, uh, I, again, I think he'll be a, a right tackle. And uh, he could play left. You know, uh, I'm a Lions fan. I know they could use him right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a there's a lot of teams who are looking for guys who are you know at least six seven and and 320 oh, yeah. pounds. So he's he's a massive guy. Yeah. And uh, it'll be interesting to see with the true speed rushers in the NFL how he matches up with them. Uh, but I, I think if nothing else, he's definitely a, a dominating right tackle for somebody. All right. Now talk about uh, this game uh, with Wake Forest because uh, boy, you know Wake Forest. 
Uh, maybe if, if fans don't re- I mean, there might be fans that don't realize that th- this has actually been a, a really good year for Wake Forest. Uh, this is not going to be a pushover game. Uh, and, and, uh, not to say that Notre Dame, uh, if they're as good as their number three poll ranking suggests, uh, for the playoffs, that they should win this game, uh, going away in the fourth quarter, if they play at their best, but still, uh, this is a team that is playing solid football defensively. Uh, Elko has left themselves, uh, and a, a, a good foundation. They're still playing some pretty good defense. Uh, their quarterback Walford has coming off a huge game last week against Louisville. Uh, now the bad news is, I guess, is their uh, top receivers out for the year though, the kid Dortch. So that's bad timing for Wake Forest fans. There's no question. And, and I think, I think the loss of, of Dortch and Bates, the safety, uh, who is a very, very good football player as well. Those two things happened in the last week. If they hadn't happened, uh, this could be a, a fairly competitive game. Uh, but I think Wake, you know, they, they don't have a lot of great skill athletes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Wolford certainly played well, uh, especially lately. And I think he's a veteran, you know, a guy who can do a lot of things. But, uh, you know, without Dorch, I don't think that they'll be able to, to hang with Notre Dame points wise. You know, I think Notre Dame will shut down the running game pretty, pretty handily. And then it's a matter of teeing off on, on Wolford. And that's what Notre Dame's done all year is, you know, they shut you down in the running game and then they come after you and they do a good job of it. So I think last, last week, NC State's last 13 plays were, uh, for a total of 15 yards and four, three and out. So, you know, they, <laughs> they can definitely dominate when they can shut down the game, uh, the running game. So I expect that to be the case. Now, you flip that over, and I do think Wake Forest has a good defense. Mm-hmm. You know, and Notre Dame may have a little bit of a tough time sledding, at least initially. But I think you'll see Notre Dame attack. You know, they're they're uh, outside. You know, I think that they'll be attacking the perimeter quite a bit. And I don't think that Wake can run with Notre Dame out there. And and they have some very good t- blocking tight ends. Notre Dame does, and and some of their receivers are <laughs> devastating blockers as well. So I, I think that that's what you'll see Notre Dame do. And then they've been trying to connect. You know, the, uh, Kevin Stefferson and, and Brandon Wimbush, you know, those are two guys who need to connect on some deep balls. And that's kind of the last piece of the offense right now is, you know, Wimbush has looked great on a lot of throws and a lot of runs, but he needs to be a better deep ball thrower. And as soon as he puts that into the arsenal, they're going to be a very difficult offense to defend as well. Yeah, hopefully we'll see uh, Ejiofor, uh, who's uh, the third-rated senior defensive end prospect for our lads, go up against McGlinchey a few times. That would be nice. Uh, that sure. might be the best matchup of the day uh, in the Wake Forest Notre Dame game. Uh, so, who do you, which team scares you the most uh, between in your next three opponents? Uh, because I'm going to throw Navy in there because you never know about Navy. Uh, yeah. But uh, I would think, of course, those two road games uh, are going to be very dangerous at Miami and at Stanford. So which game right now, if you had to look at and say, yeah, that's the one that worries me the most, which one would it be? You know, it's interesting, um, and I know a lot of people won't believe me when I say this, but I really think that Stanford game, and I don't think Stanford's necessarily that good, uh, but that is very much a pride game. And uh Stanford always plays very, very well against Notre Dame, and it's very much a pride situation. So, uh, and the thing about Stanford is that kind of scares me is Notre Dame's got a lot of big guys and a lot of talent up front, but they don't have a lot of depth. And I expect Stanford to try and hammer them with their jumbo package over and over and over. You know, they don't have much as far as quarterback play right now. You know, their passing game's very up and down. Uh-huh. Uh, and if Notre Dame can't stop Bryce Love, uh, that's going to be an interesting game. So I think that that particular game is going to be closer, okay. I think, than some people think. Uh, but, I, you know, Notre Dame has a real good chance to run the table here if they just play like they've played yep. in, the, in the previous eight games. Yeah, I agree. And and look, those are good, that would be a matchup of maybe two of the best underclassmen, the two of the top maybe junior running backs in the country. Uh, sure. With Adams going up against Love, so uh, yeah, that could be a real good one. Like you said, uh, the last few years, they, both teams uh, have fought each other really hard down to the wire. Some really great classic games. Uh, what do you think uh, when when you saw the polls come out in general? Uh, anything in there that surprised you? Uh, do you think anybody's getting shortchanged, or uh, anybody that you think is wind up is getting uh, too much consideration? 
You know, uh, I heard your comments earlier about Oklahoma and Ohio State. I, I was kind of on the other side of that, and, and the reason why is I know <laughs> Oklahoma beat them at their place. Uh-huh. But I think Oklahoma is a lesser team than they were at the beginning of the year, and I think Ohio State is a better team than they were at the beginning of the year. So uh, we don't know that because sure. <laughs> they're not playing each other again, at least not for a while. Uh, but I just I have a feeling Oklahoma is just not quite the team they were in that you know first game, or I guess it was the second game. And then uh, I do think Ohio State has improved dram- dramatically. Uh, you know, I think they had a lot of young guys that just had to get, you know, their feet under them. And and you're starting to see their defense play like a lot of people thought. And now their offense is starting to come around. And, and uh, you know, I, I think JT Barrett's, the you know, the dark horse for the candidate for Heisman. I really do. Um, if he beats Michigan, you know, and and uh, they, they uh, win the championship, it's going to be hard to to vote against him because he's really played well the last few weeks and and so it wouldn't surprise me if it's a Josh Adams J T Barrett you know uh, battle down down to the wire. I really the game to watch this week I think is going to be Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. And, oh yeah. You know if if Mayfield does not win that game, obviously he's out. And uh, I think you know the the Bryce Love Josh Adams thing whoever wins that game is still in it and whoever loses is out so uh and the one guy sitting there pretty right now I think is JT Barrett so it wouldn't surprise me if he won the whole thing yeah that was uh th- that was his best performance in a big game and I think that's been the knock on him over the last few years is he hasn't been able to play his best or come up against uh you know, the Nebraska's of the world or the Rutgers of the Maryland's and put up huge numbers and then play the big games and and not play his best but he he, he played his best game of his career uh and maybe his most important game uh, and even though the schedule isn't on paper very tough looking, we know the Big Ten and we know that these games, even this week at Iowa, we, we know what Iowa has done before. I mean, just the last two years. Now, it's out at night, so maybe that helps Ohio State. But, I mean, they, they beat Michigan last year as a 21-point dog. They almost beat Penn State earlier this year at home as a 13-point dog at home, both games at home. So Ohio State better watch out. After an emotional win, that one won't be so easy. And then Michigan State uh, has also uh, had some pretty good success against Ohio State over the last few years. And then you got Michigan. So uh, one of those games, just uh, one more loss could do Ohio State in. Yeah, there's no question. One loss and they're out. There's no doubt about it. So I, and it's going to be interesting. You know, Iowa's very, very tough at home. Very tough. And, and I don't think this is necessarily a great Iowa team, but it, it, a lot of times in these big games, that doesn't matter. You know, it's just, that's just the way the game unfolds. And Iowa usually plays sound defense and that gives them a chance to win, you know, a lot of games. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. And, and, I mean, I do think Ohio State's the better team out of all those, you know, whether it's Iowa, Michigan State, or Michigan. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're going to win them all, that's for sure. All right, Mike. So, uh, again, irishsportsdaily.com. And that's for all Irish fans, all sports, everything, right? That includes for basketball fans getting ready for the basketball season next week. Oh, oh yeah. A lot of people say this is a, this is a basketball school now. So <laughs> they're very excited about Notre Dame basketball and the job Mike Bray's done so far. Well, I, I look forward to talking to you again, especially Notre Dame just keeps on winning. Uh, there'll be some other big games to talk to you about the rest of the season. So, Mike, I appreciate your time, and uh, good luck uh, this season, and hopefully we'll talk to you real soon. Yeah, I appreciate it, Greg. Have me on any time. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. You bet. Goodbye. Mike Frank, publisher, irishsportsdaily.com. And uh, Notre Dame, by the way, is a 14-and-a-half point favorite in that game. You know, I didn't really think that that line moved too much. Let me see. Did the line move much? Because if it didn't, and it's still 14 and a half, if it's still, the number is still relatively the same as it was. uh, Yeah, still the same. Now, that could change. Of course, it'll change a lot as we get closer to tomorrow, uh, especially on game day. Uh, But I got to tell you right now, with Dorch out, the, uh, you know, you take out, a couple of key guys for Wake Forest, one on offense and one on defense, and they don't have a very deep team personnel wise, uh, as Mike said, then, then watch out. Uh, that's not good. That's not a good recipe for Wake Forest. Cause look what happened in North Carolina state. Remember we talked about it on Monday uh, about how NC state uh, really suffered with not having Heinz in. I mean, once Heinz went down in the Notre Dame game, uh, they didn't have their speed back. 
and as good as a player as Sam Wells is, and he's the top pro, uh, pro, pos- uh, pro prospect on offense for the Wolfpack, uh, still, you know, you take out that speed dynamic in that backfield, that really hurt North Carolina State. So same thing with Wake. You take out their best receiver. They don't have a deep uh, skill position group, uh, key defender, especially the receiver, Dorch. And I think that's a big blow. And uh, I, I originally was thinking, eh, you know, maybe this game could be close and uh, maybe Notre Dame pulls away in the fourth quarter. And I'm not saying that still can't happen uh, because if, if being the fact that Notre Dame is still pretty much a one dimensional offense. Now, has Wimbush through, has he thrown the ball a little bit better lately? Yes. If he can continue to do that, that's great. Uh, that's what's going to have to happen more than likely if you're going to have a realistic ch- chance at a national championship. But hey, look, we've seen teams play over the last few years in national championships. All you got to do is just take a look at Alabama a couple of years ago with Coker. Now, he did play well during the playoffs. He did throw the ball well, uh, gave them a little bit of uh, uh, a balance on offense. Uh, and I don't even know if Wimbush can play like that in, in, even in a, just a couple of games. Maybe he could because nobody expected Coker to play like that. But that's really what you have to do to step things up once you get to the playoffs. You're going to have to at least more than likely have one game where your quarterback is going to have to win the game for you. He's going to have to play well. These teams are just too competitive nowadays. There aren't any, even Alabama. I mean, there's just constant talk all the time about putting Alabama on this pedestal, and they deserve to be there. At, for, and, and I get it. I get it. They deserve to be uh, considered the top team in college football just about every year, no matter what the situation is. No matter how many guys graduate from that team that get picked in the first and second round in the NFL draft, they always just seem to be the team. And the main reason is they're so deep and they have so much good talent and then have a few players on offense and defense that are very good. And that, and, and especially because they're so well, this is a coach so well defensively that they play in these games every week and they're able to kind of dominate. And sometimes that's good because they'll wear down a team because they're they have they're they can go three deep. You know, usually a team that they're gonna play on a weekly basis goes one. And they have better talent, one, two, three deep. You know, their three deep is a lot of times better than the opposition's number one group. So they just wear these teams out as the season wears on, as the games wear on. But they're vulnerable. And they're vulnerable because they don't have that passing game. And, and since the passing game is not there, if you can stop the running game, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying shut them down, you stop the running game a little bit, and you force, say, a Jalen Hurst to throw the ball, now all of a sudden you're getting into a, a situation where you he has to make plays. So same thing with Notre Dame. You know, if you're going to stop Josh Adams, now Wimbush is going to have to come up and he's going to have to make some plays. But does Notre Dame have the defense that, say, we've seen Alabama have? to win national championships. Now, I don't know about that, but again, Elko is doing a tremendous job. Uh, they sure are playing like it right now, uh, but they're going to have to step up on competition soon enough. And they will with these games coming up against Miami and Stanford. Uh, and then of course, if they do get to the playoffs, uh, he, you know, going up against some really big time teams like right now, Alabama, Georgia, who they've already played and lost. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then uh, number four, Clemson. And, and, and look, I don't think they're, better than Clemson right now. I still think <clears throat> I still think Clemson would be the team to beat in my mind. I really do. Uh, but, you know, you know me. I like Georgia. I like Clemson. And uh, I think Alabama is very good. I get that. Do I think they're any better than the last few years of Alabama teams? No, I don't. They just lost too much over the last couple of years to be any any better than those teams. But you know what? They don't really have to be. And, and that's why they're Alabama. But this is a really fun year. There's so many teams that are in it, including Oklahoma and Oklahoma State in the Big 12. Can a Big 12 team get to the playoffs? That's big. That'd be big for the conference. They have a championship game, which is huge. Oklahoma right now fifth in the playoff poll. Oklahoma State 11th in the playoff poll. So this rivalry game, Bedlam game, is just about as big as you're going to see 4 o'clock on Saturday. 
Uh, coming up in about a half hour, we're going to have Scott Wright, and he's going to give us the Oklahoma State perspective. But right now, we're going to get the Oklahoma perspective from Ryan Aber, and he's the beat writer for the Sooners at the Oklahoman and also at NewsOK.com. So, Ryan, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right, Ryan. So big game, as always. Tell me, uh, knowing this game as you do, this rivalry game, uh, what makes it so special? Well, I think just the name. It's, it's Bedlam. It's one that uh, divides a lot of households and families in this state. There's a lot of a lot of people on both sides. And for a long time, it was very one-sided, not just in the game and the rivalry sense, but success period. Oklahoma obviously has been one of uh, college football's great programs. Oklahoma State really hadn't been until the last uh, 10 or 15 years. It's first Les Miles, and then uh, Mike Gundy has continued that. But even during this stretch where uh, Oklahoma State has risen to prominence nationally, they haven't been able to win this game very often. And that's something that's uh, one of the few dings on Mike Gundy's resume has been his success in Bedlam. Bob Stoops was fantastically successful in this game, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if Lincoln Riley is able to keep that up or if Gundy is able to uh, turn it around and, and finally get Oklahoma State uh, on the right side of this game. Yeah, that is something to keep in mind, that uh, every big moment or different moment uh, that Riley has to face is a, is a first time, You know, whether it's uh, having to face Texas and that rivalry, uh, the Bedlam rivalry, uh, you know, any any different type of tough assignment that a co- going to Ohio State. So he's passed most of the tests so far. I guess the one test he, he hasn't passed was the Ohio State loss was that. All right. That that we're, we're 31 point favorite test after a buy or something. I mean, I don't know. I mean, every coach is going to have a first of situation you got to deal with. So let's start, first of all, with that with that that loss in that situation. What exactly happened? Not that I, Iowa State hasn't proven already that they're a good football team, uh, but what happened in that particular game? Anything specifically different that stuck out where, where, where you noticed something either right away or just during the game where you go, yeah, they just didn't do this or that particularly well this week? Well, I think the big thing is their, their ability to defend uh, on the back end. They struggled at corner. Jordan Thomas uh, had, gave up the, the, t- the game-winning touchdown to Alan Lazard. But before that, even Oklahoma wasn't able to react to the quarterback change for Iowa State. Obviously, uh, they were preparing for Jacob Park in that one. It came out late in the week that it didn't seem like Park was going to play. He wound up not making the trip, and they used Kyle Kemp, who was a completely different kind of quarterback, and he was able to really hurt the Sooners uh, defensively. Now, you look at the other side of the ball, Oklahoma had a lot of success early in that game, but once Abdul Adams got hurt and then uh, C.D. Lamb got a little bit banged up in that game as well, that really took the wind out of Oklahoma's sails. And uh, you look at it then and you think, oh, that's an awful loss to lose to a team like Iowa State who hadn't beaten them in so long. But uh, certainly the Cyclones have proven themselves with the way that they performed since, especially with the win over TCU. I don't think there's any team in the country right now who uh, has two quality wins, the likes of what Iowa State has. But still, I know there's a lot of people in Norman and in around Oklahoma that would love to see the Sooners face the Cyclones again in the Big 12 championship. Game. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of fans in Iowa State that would love that too. Uh, just to get there <laughs> would be a big accomplishment for them. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> since then, a couple of close games, but hey, big, you know, big, nice wins, uh, tough, tough competition, beating Texas and, and winning at Lawrence is never uh, uh, is is never an easy assignment. Uh, Manhattan, excuse me, is never an easy assignment to go up against Bill Snyder. So got got away with that uh, and then blow out Texas Tech. OK, so uh, what has changed or, or, or how has this team gotten any better? Uh, compare it to where they are now and where they were when they beat Ohio State. Well, I think the, the big area that they've gotten better at is just the continued uh, depth at running back that they've added. Uh, you remember in that Ohio State game, Trey Sermon was such a big part in the second half of that one. He's had some fantastic games, but to get Rodney Anderson going the way he's gone the last couple of weeks, and yeah. he's combined for somewhere in the neighborhood of 320 yards over the last two games, 
has been a big addition. He's just a, a big, strong power guy who can do a lot of the same things that Samaj P. Ryan did for this team the last couple of years. We all know what Baker Mayfield can do. Uh, C.D. Lamb has continued to get better and better. They're a freshman receiver. On defense, uh, the last couple of weeks, they've made some adjustments after uh, some problems early that have really paid off for them. And uh, they struggled early against Kansas State for much of that first half before finally turning around late in the half. Uh, Texas Tech, they couldn't slow down anything that the Red Raiders were doing in the first quarter of that game and then played absolutely fantastically for the last three quarters. So it's going to be tough. They're going to have to make those adjustments quicker, I think, on Saturday in Stillwater in order to be successful because uh, Oklahoma State's a team that can really run away and hide from you with how powerful they are on offense. But you see some of the things starting to come around. They're starting to get more pressure on quarterbacks uh, from their defensive side. Their corners have played better since that Iowa State game, even though they've uh, given up a couple things against Kansas State and against Texas Tech. But uh, like I said, there's there's some promising signs there. They just need to uh, be much more consistent here these next couple weeks with Oklahoma State and TCU. What have you? What did you notice in, in the Ohio State game with the Buckeyes and then the way they played against Penn State? I mean, because uh, everybody is, is oh, well, Ohio State's a completely different team. They're much better. I'm not saying they aren't. I mean, when you're a football team, you're supposed to get better as the year goes on. And uh, Barrett played really well against Penn State. But was there something in that game that you saw and you were, you were surprised about with Ohio State? Were you, oh, I, I thought they were better than this. Or was there something that Oklahoma did specifically where – where you weren't very surprised at all about the outcome? Well, I, I think I was surprised at how, how dominant the outcome was. I mean, the, the final score was 31-16. to 16. I don't even think it felt as close as that. Oklahoma pretty well dominated that game from the first, even in the first half where they were putting together long drives. They just couldn't quite finish them. So it was a, a really dominant performance. Oklahoma's defense played fantastically in that game. I was surprised that Ohio State wasn't able to run the ball uh, better than they could in that one. Uh, JT Barrett made some questionable decisions in that. Clearly, he's gotten better. And I don't think there's any doubt that Ohio State is a much better team now than they were on September 9th when Oklahoma won in Columbus. I think the problem, though, is you can't make that trump what happened September 9th in Columbus, which yeah. is a pretty thorough win. And I thought the College Football Playoff Committee got it absolutely right. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at programs both with one loss or with no, a zero loss team to a one loss team i think you've got to uh, have head to head as the first determining factor now if the if the second loss gets thrown in there then things get much different but uh, clearly right now i feel like oklahoma deserves to be ahead of ohio state ohio state certainly deserves to be ahead of penn state and uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that grouping plays out as the season goes on especially if they continue to win all right uh baker mayfield now uh, i've uh, me uh, you know being a jets fan and in dire need of a franchise quarterback uh i'm looking at this draft and i'm seeing okay maybe if sam darnold comes out comes out nobody knows if he will uh josh uh, uh, allen josh rosen uh, if everybody does come out or th two out of the three come out with Mayfield and Rudolph, that's what I'm hoping for, because uh, the more quarterbacks, better chance you're going to get uh, one of these guys. I don't necessarily think Baker Mayfield, uh, if, if four or five of these guys come out, is going to be the top guy. He may not even be the number two guy. And I'm OK with that because the Jets aren't going to wind up getting one of those top uh, picks uh, because I want Baker Mayfield. Uh, he's the guy that I think would be a perfect fit in New York. Uh, I think if uh, if he does uh, wind up, because uh, because here's the thing that I know that has concerned Dan Shanka, it has concerned maybe some other people is it is is the way that he can conduct himself from time to time. Uh, there have been some comparisons to Johnny Manziel, uh, not to the extent of how crazy Manziel has been at times, but there's been some comparisons. Uh, so tell me why there would be a concern, even on your behalf, about. Baker Mayfield at the next level and maybe even going to a, a place like New York and uh, being able to handle it. I actually think he'd be able to handle a place like New York pretty well because yes, he is brash. He is uh, borderline cocky. He goes and, and does these things that uh, he's everybody's favorite player. I think that's an OU fan and he's the guy that everybody else who, whose team has to face OU just absolutely despises, and I think that plays well 
in a place like New York. Now, there are questions about him, his size, most notably, his sure. arm strength. But uh, I think the way he's able to, to fight through things, the way he's able to, to uh, uh, fit tight throws into, into very tough places, he's almost a, a Brett Favre type, but he's also got that mobility. And you talk about the Johnny Manziel comparison, and certainly that's something that, that comes up with him quite a bit. But he's not the guy who's gone out, and, and yes, I know that the uh, the arrest happened in Fayetteville, Arkansas, over the summer or the winter, and there's the video of him getting slammed to the concrete, and certainly that's not a good look for anybody, but he's not doing a lot of those things, the, the wild and crazy things that we saw from Johnny Menzel during his time at Texas A&M. He's had uh, that brush, and that was really about it as far as anything public with him. So uh, I think he's a guy who's not going to be the first or even the second or third quarterback taken yeah. in this draft yeah. but if he winds up in the right place the right system that can take advantage of his skills i think he's got a chance to play for a long time in the nfl yeah and that, that's why i'm uh real excited about the possibilities as i said because uh, i agree i don't think he's going to be one of the first uh and again it all does depend on how many of these guys come out uh so talk about some of these other pro prospects on the team uh what about mark andrews uh, he busted out on the scene as a freshman and uh, he's making big plays again. Uh, boy, he just looks like he's going to be maybe one of the top tight end prospects that we've seen in a while. I know O.J. Howard had a, there was a lot of talk about him last year, but uh, there's just something about uh, Mark Andrews that looks pretty special at the next level. So uh, talk about how good he could be. Yeah, absolutely, especially because of the matchup problems that he can create. He's uh, got that tight end size, but a lot of the same skill sets as a wide receiver. He generally plays slot for the Sooners. He actually rarely lines up at a true tight end spot, but his ability to, to find openings, especially underneath uh, in, against defenses and go up and be physical and make some plays, but also be able to go downfield. And he's a, been a touchdown machine for the Sooners, especially his first two years. Uh, this year they've used him in some different ways, but uh, I, I think he's a guy who might wind up uh, finding a, a really significant role in an NFL offense, maybe even more significant than uh, the one he has at OU. But he's been really valuable uh, for the Sooners as well. Uh, Orlando Brown is Dan Shonka's number one rated tackle prospect uh, right now for the NFL draft. Uh, how good is Orlando Brown? He's been fantastic. And Oklahoma's faced a lot of the best defensive lines in the country. They faced Ohio State. Texas defensive line is, is really good. They're going to face another one, and I know this sort of draws some laughs, and I know it drew some uh, strange looks when Orlando Brown talked about it early in the season, but he's going to face a pretty good defensive line in Kansas here in a couple weeks as well, and they've got some, some pro prospects on that team. But Orlando Brown has passed every test. He's a guy who's got so much better uh, at, with his footwork this year. He's slimmed down a little bit. He's a guy that uh, can play on either the left or right side at the next level, probably uh, going to be able to play left tackle in the NFL. Who is the best uh, prospect on defense for Oklahoma? Is, is there a clear uh, number one guy? Yeah, I think it's got to be uh, Obanya Okoronkwo, the uh, defensive end for them. Uh, he's been a mainly played linebacker until this year. They moved him up. Uh, they still call him a defensive end slash linebacker, but he's certainly mostly a defensive end for them. Just his ability to rush off the edge. He has made life miserable for several quarterbacks this year, and he seems to get better and better as the year has gone on. And I think NFL uh, scouts are starting to realize that. He's a guy who reminds you a lot of uh, Eric Stryker from a few years ago as far oh, as what okay. he does at the college level. But his size is much more conducive to being able to uh, continue that in the NFL than Stryker was. And Stryker was pretty undersized and uh, wound up not finding a place in the league. And uh, Dan has Jordan Thomas as his third-ranked senior cornerback uh, in uh, the 2018 Arleds NFL Draft Preview brochure that is out at Arleds.com. So, uh, and he also, of course, is rated Stephen Parker uh, at safety. But uh, Jordan Thomas, uh, one of the top cornerbacks, uh, that uh, looks like uh, will be available for the NFL draft this year, him being a senior. Uh, how, what, how do you compare Thomas to some of the other? Because Oklahoma, of course, as you know, they've had a lot of uh, quality DBs that have uh, come out of that program over the years. How does he compare? Well, he, he started off really well and, and had a made a splash as a freshman, 
he struggled a little bit this year. I think mainly his teams uh, were forced to go away from Parnell Motley thanks to his success, the, the uh, sophomore for them. He had a lot of success early in the year, and teams tried to test Jordan Thomas. But Jordan Thomas is playing better and better as the weeks gone, have gone on. He finally had an interception a couple weeks ago. He's sort of getting his footing under him as a senior. You obviously hope that uh, a senior doesn't have to go through that, but uh, he's starting to fight through it. And I thought Stephen Parker maybe got a little bit overlooked early in the season uh, as he uh, had some struggles as well as safety. But uh, Stephen Parker, I think, has been probably their best DB over the last month or so. And uh, if those guys can get better and better, certainly that they're they're going to rise up because they've got the raw talent. I think to uh, to be at the next level, we see what Aaron Colvin's doing in Jacksonville, and uh, I think uh, Jordan Thomas at his peak can be right up there with uh, a guy like Colvin. So, uh, so Motley uh, is uh, is is a player, a sophomore, young kid. He he's he's an up and coming top player in the secondary. Yeah, absolutely. He's been fantastic for them. Uh, Kansas State made a throw over the top of him that. Uh, got them tied late in that game. But really, outside of that, he's been really successful this year. He's had two interceptions, might have had a third in that Ohio State game, had uh, Lincoln Riley chosen to review a play in the end zone late in that game when it was pretty well already decided. But I think Parnell Motley is a guy that's going to get better and better. Uh, I talked to Jordan Thomas about him about a month ago, and he said that last year when he watched Motley practice, he wondered if he would ever – be able to contribute at this level because his footwork was so bad mm. but uh, he put in the time and the effort over the off season to become a better player uh, beat out a guy who had started uh, most of last year as a freshman Jordan Parker who wound up unfortunately suffering a season ending injury in the season opener but uh, Parnell Motley has been fantastic for them and you would expect that growth to continue with him over the next couple of years. Uh, talk uh, about Lincoln Riley. I remember uh, a few years ago when I was uh, uh, paying attention to what he was doing over at East Carolina. And I said, and I don't know, it must have been three or four years ago. And I said, hey, this guy, without a doubt, is going to be one of the hot young coaching candidates, head coaching candidates in college football. Uh, then he moves over to Oklahoma. And I figured, OK, maybe in five or six years, that's a, that'll be a good gig for him to take over for Bob Stoops. And then all of a sudden, boom, he, he gets the job this year. Everybody gets surprised that Bob Stoops steps down, and he's the man. So how's he been doing? Well, I, I think he's done a, a great job. And you look at the, the test uh, that you talked about. He's he's came through his first big road game against Ohio State. Yep. He won his first OU Texas game. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, He's got his, his first Bedlam game coming up. And to this point, outside of that Iowa State game, he's passed pretty much every test and the other thing is uh he's really boosted oklahoma on the recruiting trail and i think uh that's going to something that's really going to pay off over the next couple of years uh it'll be interesting to see if he's able to elevate their recruiting level on defense as it's been so difficult for this league to really recruit high level defensive players but if he's able to turn that tide certainly that completely changes the dynamic of things but uh lincoln riley is for the most part, stuck with a lot of what Bob Stoops did, but uh, he's made some some changes and tweaks along the way. I'm sure we'll continue to see uh, some more of those down the road. But the reason that Bob Stoops felt comfortable enough to step away when he did is because he felt like Lincoln Riley was the guy and didn't want to uh, take the chance of Lincoln Riley getting a head coaching job somewhere yeah. else hmm. and then having to scramble around once Bob Stoops decided it was time to step away. Okay. All right, so uh, now let's, uh, let's close and talk about this game. Uh, Oklahoma State's a two-point favorite at home against Oklahoma right now. The Sooners have, have won two straight in this series, four to five. Two of the last five have got, gone to overtime. Uh, what, 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 what's this, uh, what are you looking forward to as far as matchups here, specific matchups? I've noticed how, how successful the Sooners have been running the football over those, uh, over those uh, last uh, five games, especially over the last few years. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming with uh, with Rodney Anderson uh, doing such a great job, as you mentioned at the at the outset, uh, starting to pick things up on the ground, uh, that could be a key uh, for this matchup. Rudolph also hasn't played particularly well. Uh, didn't really get in there. I mean, played limit limited uh, uh, duty in 2015 after the upset win in 2014, and then did not play particularly well last year. So uh, Mayfield has outplayed him the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. Mason Rudolph still hasn't had a, a big 
moment in this in this game uh, a couple years ago when they won. It was really uh, they really limited what they let Mason Rudolph do. They primarily kept it on the ground, and then obviously Tyree Kill had that big kick return or punt return that uh, forced that game into overtime, and Oklahoma State was able to come out with the upset. But uh, the last couple of years, Mason Rudolph has struggled. Uh, they really didn't pass the ball, and it seems like. Mike Gundy got conservative, especially last year, but really the last couple of years in this series. So that's one thing I'm looking for is will Oklahoma State open up, open things up and really try to test the Sooners, especially downfield with their great receivers, James Washington and Marcel Leitman. I think uh, James Washington versus Parnell Motley, uh, the corner that we talked about a little bit, yeah. is going to be a fantastic matchup to watch in this game as well. And then the other thing to me, when you're talking about OU's defense, is how much pressure they're able to get with one Obanya Okoronkwo uh, coming off the edge on one side, and then DJ Ward, who's been so much better uh, over the last three weeks and months uh, at getting uh, to quarterbacks. I think if those two guys are able to get in the backfield consistently, then it's going to be tough for Oklahoma State to really be able to spread things out offensively. If they're not, then Mason Rudolph can really, really hurt you in this passing game. And then uh, on the other side of the ball, I, I look for Mark Andrews, uh, the matchup with him, uh, whether it's against Ramon Richards, the safety, or whether it's against a linebacker, uh, Edison Magruder on that side. I think Mark Andrews is a really, di- really difficult matchup for a defense. And Oklahoma State better fa- figure out a way to account for him. Otherwise, it's going to be a long day. Uh, before I let you go, Ryan, what is your gut feeling about this team's chances? Uh, of course, they're going to have to run the table to win the uh, to, to get to the playoffs. So, uh, it, first of all, of course, if if you think they're going to do that, uh, and then uh, whether or not they do do that, that this team has what it takes that a lot of these other previous teams have not been able to do at Oklahoma. A lot of disappointment over the years in the big game for Oklahoma. Uh, did the Ohio State win? Did that change every the, the mindset of this particular team that they can actually win the big game? Are you getting that feeling? Uh, Baker Mayfield's last year. Is this the team that could win another national championship? I think certainly they've got the potential. Now the question is, will their defense play up to the level that it needs to to get there? And they were absolutely fantastic against Ohio State. They've struggled quite a bit since then. But I think as you get outside of the league, things change and, and you're able to play better defense than maybe you can against these teams that, one, know what you do defensively, and two, uh, have the offenses that really match up well with those things. So I think they've gotten the potential. Yes, it's going to be tough. Uh, they've really, I think this week, when you talk about the regular season and possibly even into the Big 12 championship game, this week is their most difficult challenge with what Oklahoma State does well versus what they've struggled with. But uh, it's going to be fun. I think uh, I would love to see Baker Mayfield in his final year make it back to the college football playoff and, and see what he's able to do with the Sooners team because their offense, at least, is, is incredible to watch. Their defense can be a little bit uh, head-scratching at times, but Mike Stoops has made some good adjustments the last couple of weeks. We'll see if he's able to keep making those adjustments to get them in the right position to get back into the college football playoff at the end of the year. Ryan, uh, great job again. Oh, the Oklahoman, uh, and uh, you, go, you go to newsok.com uh, and uh, check out everything regarding uh, Oklahoma football. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, best of luck uh, with the game, and we definitely look forward to talking to you again, and hopefully if the team keeps playing well, uh, maybe by the end of the season. Sounds great. Anytime. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Ryan. Thank All right, you. that's Ryan Aber. And again, Ryan is a beat writer for the Oklahoman, as is Scott Wright. And Scott Wright's going to join us in a couple of minutes to talk about Oklahoma State football. So that's coming up. Uh, But yeah, as as Ryan said, when when we first got actually pretty much as we first started talking, he was he mentioned about uh, the fact that they not only got this game this week, we got the rivalry game. But then you have to focus and take on TCU next week. Now, they catch a break with the fact that if they do win this game, they get TCU at home. So they, they, they do catch a break. You don't want to have to go on the road. I mean, normally that wouldn't be a good situation. Um, sometimes it's different, but you just, just don't want to do that normally. So they do get them at home. 
Uh, TCU coming off the loss to, uh, to Iowa State, and they have a game this week against Texas. Now, I, I've told you for weeks that I just didn't buy in on TCU as a national championship team, not with Kenny Hill. We saw that last week. I mean, Kenny Hill is, is not a difference maker, a quarterback. He's a nice player. He is a nice player. You know, he has his limitations, though. And football is, especially when there's so many teams that are equal, uh, you, you sometimes have to talk, ask your quarterback to do things for you. Uh, and, and Hill's had his share of good games, but he, he's not an elite player at that position. And TCU is not really where they were yet. Now, maybe they're getting there. Of course, the defense is playing better. And that's important for Patterson because I don't know what's happened the last couple of years to that defense. But they're going back to playing better defense now. And we'll find out because this Texas game ain't going to be easy first because we could see TCU in the Big 12 championship game. So these are some big games coming up. Matter of fact, Iowa State's at West Virginia. So what happens with Iowa State now coming off the big win? Now, remember, Iowa State had the, the – they, look, they've had the two top five wins, so it's not like they haven't done this before. And after they beat Oklahoma, now th they did catch a break. As I mentioned, you have a big win, you go home. And that's, that's that was important. And it was also important that they played Kansas. But it wasn't a close game, and they muddled through it. They destroyed Kansas. That's That's a good sign. So can they do that again? You know, because in the last four weeks, three of their wins for the Cyclones, two have been on the road. Two of them have been against, not the road games, but, you know, two road wins, two wins against top five teams. Uh, you're coming off the, 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 the field being stormed last week, and now you got to go to Morgantown. Now, look, Iowa State right now at this point in the season is a better team than West Virginia. They have proven it. But they have to go to West Virginia, and then Iowa State hosts Oklahoma State. All right? And then the last two games, now they go to Baylor, but then they end the season against Kansas State on the road. So I, I, it's, 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 I think it's a tricky situation for Iowa State to, to, to make it to the Big 12 championship game. Now, there could be three teams, two losses in the Big 12. That could happen. I mean, maybe everybody beats everybody else, you know, everybody else up. And then you get some sort of a tiebreaker situation. And then maybe the winner of this game, which, of course, if Oklahoma, see, if Oklahoma wins this game, the big edge that they have uh, over Oklahoma State, as far as the Big 12 championship game is, is Oklahoma State lost the conference game to TCU. Uh, Oklahoma's lost their conference game. Uh, but you take a look at the schedule. And I don't know. I, I just think that. I I feel a little bit, believe it or not, and I don't know if it's just because it's home and away, but maybe it's just because of what, what we've seen with Iowa State. That I think I said this, um, I've said this before, when, when in other situations, when a team like Iowa State, when a program like Iowa State is having a really good season that you're not expecting, and they're just playing tremendous, uh, and 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 then they face, say, these next two weeks. And they've got TCU, excuse me, they've got West Virginia on the road this week, Iowa State does. And then next week they're at home against Oklahoma State. I just, I look at that and I say, well, considering how good of a season Iowa State's had, can I see Iowa State dropping two straight now? Everything that they've done, top five wins, uh, beating Oklahoma and Oklahoma, are they going to lose back to back? Sure, of course they could, absolutely. But will they? And that's why I just have a feeling that that game uh, – and, and look, some people go, of course, that game should be tougher. Iowa State gets the game at home. TCU would have to go on the road. But look, I, most people still would believe – I don't, but most people still would believe that TCU is a better team than Iowa State. And they would believe that, yeah, I mean, come on. It's got to be a tougher matchup for Oklahoma against TCU next week than Oklahoma State against Iowa State. But I don't think that at all. Not at all. So I think that's a big edge for Oklahoma. Uh, whereas if Oklahoma State were to beat them uh, and uh, they go up a game inside the conference that I could easily see, especially emotional win, beating your rival, and now you're going to go on the road uh, to Ames and play an uh, Iowa State team that's already beaten a couple of top 10, top five teams because Oklahoma State would be top 10 next week. Imagine Iowa State winning three times in one season against top 10 teams. 
So anyway, it just shows you that th- there's just going to be th- there's a lot of football to be played in the Big 12. And uh, but th- this these are two teams that a lot of people thought were the two top teams when the season began in the Big 12. And now they get to face off and determine who's going to have the major edge, major edge if they win it. Uh, and uh, and again, uh, it, it, it does not mean that whoever wins this game is going to win the Big 12, uh, Big 12 because we have a Big 12 championship game, but they'll definitely have an edge either way. So uh, let's now talk uh, about let's get inside of Oklahoma State and uh, welcome in also from the Oklahoman uh, at NewsOK.com, uh, Oklahoma State football writer Scott Wright. Scott, thanks for taking your time to talk to us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, Scott. So uh, I was able to talk to Ryan and get the Oklahoma Sooners perspective. So now I'm going to get the uh, Cowboys perspective. Uh, so let me ask you, it's first off, uh, regarding uh, this this rivalry, what, what is it about all the, the Bedlam games that uh, you've been able to see? What is it that makes uh, this rivalry special to you, uh, comparing it to other rivalries that you know about in college football? Well, you know, it's interesting because this rivalry has been going on for a really long time, uh, but it only became a really good rivalry within the last 18 years or so. Okay. Um, this was a, a – and, and it still is when you look at the numbers of a really one-sided rivalry. Uh, but, you know, Les Miles, uh, when he came to Oklahoma State, really started trying to convince the Oklahoma State team, the Oklahoma State fan base, that OU was their big rival, and it wasn't just a game that they uh, that they wanted to, to to go win. It was a game that they needed to uh, aspire to compete in every sure. year. Sure, and and it was uh, they they loved winning it, but but they weren't doing it very much, and they weren't in the game very much. So uh, you know, from that point on, uh, they've really started to build their program uh, to get to a level where uh, where they're right here with Oklahoma and that's what uh, what they've finally been able to do now under under Mike Gundy and it's uh, it's really taken this uh, this rivalry to another level uh, to the point that uh, you know game day ESP game day had never come to Stillwater before uh, 2004 when they came up for a bedlam game hmm. now they've uh, they're coming for the sixth time <laughs> and five of them have been for bedlam games now, do you think that that is the that one of the edges that you would hope that Oklahoma State would have is is Mike Gundy and and all the, the all all these games that he's been a part of compared to Lincoln Riley as a head coach? You hope so. You don't know what exactly uh, you know uh, how Lincoln is going to be in uh, in these situations. Obviously, he's had his experience with the uh, the OU Texas game, which is a big rivalry game. Um, but a different feel than uh, than going on uh, somebody else's turf and uh, and playing, being that it's at a neutral site. So um, this will be an interesting uh, experiment to see how Lincoln Riley handles himself in uh, in Boone Pickens Stadium on Saturday. Uh, Mike Gundy knows what it takes to uh, to, to handle uh, the atmosphere of, of a game like this. And uh, now, of course, um, Lincoln's going up to uh, to Columbus oh, with yeah. the other OSU and won a game. So it's not like he's going to be afraid. <laughs> Of uh, of the atmosphere, so I, I don't want to uh, don't want to sound misleading with that, but um, but yeah, you uh, Mike Gundy has a lot of experience in this game and the, uh, the the tense atmosphere that it creates. How about uh, Mason Rudolph and the fact that he hasn't particularly played well? Uh, he didn't play well last year uh, in this game. Uh, just uh, limited snaps uh, in 2015. Uh, and uh, even though he was a part, of course, of the uh, the upset win in 2014. So uh, what about hi- him needing, no question, to have his best game of the series in order to win this game? Yeah, he absolutely does. You know, last year, um, I think Oklahoma State coaches got a little conservative because um, he has a little bit of a reputation of not being great uh, in uh, in bad weather and cold and rainy situation last year. They sort of uh, they sort of shackled him a little bit and uh, and didn't give him a chance to do a lot of the things that he can do um, and so I think you know we're expecting 70 degrees and uh, and sunny on uh, on Saturday so I think that uh, that he's going to get the opportunity to uh, to to be himself. The question comes down to exactly how Oklahoma wants to try to defend them. They want to do the things that uh, teams like. TCU and Texas and West Virginia have done where they're backing a lot of guys up, 
trying to force them to run the ball, or if they're going to, if Oklahoma's going to play their uh, their standard defense and and give him some shots with uh, with one on one coverage with James Washington and Marcel Aitman and uh, and those guys where he can uh, try to throw the ball deep. Well, talk about Rudolph and him being uh, one of the top prospects to, that you know he'll, he'll of course be graduating. He's uh, right now number two as far as senior quarterback prospects for our lads. So uh, talk about what you've seen uh, from him over his career, uh, especially this being his final year. That leads you to believe that he is going to be a successful pro, uh, especially when you compare him maybe to some other Oklahoma State quarterbacks that haven't been so successful at the next level. You know the thing that I think sets Mason Rudolph apart is is the mental side. Uh, he is he's incredibly mature uh, mentally. Not to say that uh, that Brandon Whedon wasn't. I think he uh, he was as well. Um, and and Whedon had probably more physical tools than uh, than than what Mason Rudolph has, um, especially arm strength at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Rudolph's. Uh, Ability to prepare himself for for a game, uh, to uh, to understand a game plan, understand what he's seeing from a defense uh, when it's in front of him, and be able to adjust to it. I think is something that uh, that I don't know. I don't know if any other Oklahoma State quarterbacks that have come through, maybe even since Mike Gundy, have uh, have been able to uh, to do as well as he does. He is a he is a film junkie. He's he is watching game tape all the time. And uh, it's uh, he's a guy that that really cares about his mental preparation for a game uh, as much as his uh, as his physical preparation. I think that that is something that is going to uh, really shine when he gets to the next level. Yeah, I mean the dispositions of the two quarterbacks in this game couldn't be more different, could could they? Uh... No, no, absolutely not. It's it's pre- it's pretty it's pretty crazy. And now you know Mason has has kind of a a silly side. But we don't ever see it. It's uh, it's something that he uh, keeps, you know, to uh, back for his teammates that they see in the locker room or or in uh, you know away from the field. Um, but uh, but yeah, in the uh, in the media, Mason is very reserved, uh, very humble. I think he's I think he's humble all the time, but um, uh, very very different from uh, from Baker Mayfield. All right, talk about some of the other prospects on this team. You mentioned James Washington. Matter of fact, uh, th- th- this is a pretty good receiving core uh, with uh, McCluskey and Aitman. Uh, Aitman and Washington, though, were the top two guys. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Washington right now, uh, they're both seniors. Uh, Washington is the number two rated uh, senior receiver uh, for our lads uh, in, in the latest 2018 our lads NFL Draft Preview brochure that's available at ourlads.com. And Marcel Aitman. Uh, is uh, is not that far behind as well. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I think he's only uh, uh, he's actually sitting there at uh, somewhere in the top 20. So uh, talk about how good this receiving core is, especially Washington, compare it to maybe some other uh, receiving cores because there have been some a lot of good receivers that have also come out of this program. Yeah, ab- there absolutely have. And um, the thing that is that is so unique about this group right here is that uh, is that they've got so many guys that they've, they've got. Um, McCleskey. Now, not necessarily talking about going to the next level, but guys that are going to impact the game on Saturday. They've mm-hmm. got five or six guys who are who can be big time playmakers. Now, when you're talking about going to the next level, James Washington is uh, is so unique in his ability to uh, to be a deep threat. Uh, he just he doesn't look like you. You stand next to him and you don't think this is the guy that's that's going to fly past <laughs> a bunch of. Uh, uh, cornerbacks and safety, uh-huh. uh, but he he's just incredibly impressive in his ability to get open deep. His hands are are, uh, are ridiculously good. Um, Marcel Aitman is a, a guy that I think is probably even going to be m- more suited for the next level than he is for college football hmm. um, because you're going to see so much more man coverage uh, at, at, at the NFL level than uh, than what you're facing right now. So um, at six four two twenty. Really good hands, uh, good at using his body to uh, to get himself uh, in position to make catches. Uh, good after the catch, he blocks. Uh, he has has no uh, no issue with uh, with going and throwing a block when he needs to. So um, he does a lot of uh, a lot of the little things that you need for uh, to be a receiver at the next level. So um, I think that uh, that he's going to be uh, going to be. Uh, I think he's going to be a steal wherever somebody ends up getting him. They're going to be really surprised with uh, 
with how well he's going to uh, to mesh uh, with a receiving court at the next level. Yeah, especially uh, again, you you can't teach size, and he's got great size for the position. So uh, if he is one, if he does get drafted somewhere in the middle rounds, uh, that that could be a player definitely to keep an eye on. Uh, what about the offensive line, Zachary Crabtree? He he's the uh, the top pro prospect. Uh, what kind of uh, line uh, has it been uh, this season? Uh, there are a lot of guys back from last year. So has this been one of the better lines you've seen uh, in years for Oklahoma State? They're, uh, they're in a really good situation right now. Now, they've dealt with some injuries. Okay. They've had to do a lot of, uh, a lot of shuffling. Okay. They lost, uh, lost their right guard, Larry Williams, for the season mm-hmm. uh, three games in. Um, and uh, then uh, Crabtree, who you mentioned, is a fantastic right guard and a veteran leader on that line. He had a turf toe injury that kept him out for a game and a half. Uh, then they lost Brad Lundblade, their center, who is, uh, uh, you know, he was a walk-on who earned a, earned a starting job by the end of his freshman year, a true freshman year as a walk-on, which was pretty impressive. Wow. Uh, and then, uh, and has been the starting center ever since with, uh, with Mason Rudolph. And that's a, uh, you know, a combination that has been really uh, valuable for them. Uh, he missed a couple of games, just came back last week for West Virginia, uh, so now he's getting back to full health, and so that's been really important. Uh, the left side has stayed mostly uh, mostly solid. Marcus Keys at, at left guard, Aaron Cocker in a grad transfer, who is a, a big, strong left tackle, uh, came over from Cal this season, has uh, has been really solid on the left side for him. Um, so, uh, but they're but everybody's getting healthy and uh, been able to uh, to get in uh, at least a decent number of of practice snaps in preparation for this game this week. So uh, that's been a really important thing for them um, because when they're when they're all t- playing together mm-hmm. and uh, and and uh, and healthy, they they are a really good offensive line, one of the better ones that we've seen probably since the uh, the 2011 team. So okay. um, really solid, really solid unit up there. Uh, concerned at all, uh, the coaching staff, the players concerned at all about uh, how many times they turned the ball over last week yeah that was uh that was a big issue that and uh and special teams play were the big the two big things that came out of that that ball game that really stuck with them uh to uh to have as many uh you know they uh justice hill their their star running back uh fumbled on uh and took a really hard hit that actually kept him out for a couple of quarters uh before he got cleared to go back in the game um but they ended up using three different running backs and they all three lost a fumble uh, so that was uh, that was that was disturbing. Uh, they did have the pick six. They had a punt block that got recovered for a touchdown. So um, between uh, the turnovers and the special teams issues, those were the two things that they looked at and and felt really fortunate to get out of oh, Morgantown yeah. with with an 11 point victory. All right, on defense, uh, Trey Flowers is he the top guy there? Uh, pro prospect uh, for our lads. Uh, I believe he is the third rated strong safety senior prospect uh, on the board right now. Uh, so uh, would, would would he be the guy uh, uh, clearly that, uh, that that leads this defense? He uh, he absolutely is. Now they um, they don't have a ton of uh, they, they don't necessarily have a, a big time uh, pro prospect type of guy on the defensive line. The defensive okay. line is going to be important because they they have a lot of depth. They rotate a lot of guys, and those are going to be the guys that have to go chase Baker Mayfield around, and try to contain him. Uh, but on the back end, absolutely, uh, Trey Flowers is their is their playmaker. He's their anchor, uh, senior, uh, really veteran guy, six three, two hundred, and uh, can do a lot of different things for them back there, aside from just being a, a, a senior voice that sort of uh, leads that unit. It's got two first year starters at corner. And a uh, and another safety who used to be a cornerback and is, and is in his first year playing safety. So um, he's a a very important piece on the back end of of that defense. He can uh, he can be physical, come up and uh, and make tackles in the uh, in the run game. And he's got a couple of picks on the back end playing uh, in coverage as well. Um, he's a guy that could end up in coverage against Mark Andrews, who is obviously a mismatch nightmare. Uh, in Oklahoma's offense, the yep. big uh, tight end type of guy. I don't know. That he's really a tight end. He's just a big dude <laughs> who uh, catches passes. Um, and he, so, so Trey Flowers could end up in coverage on him, which could be a, uh, a crucial matchup in this game. What, uh, what about this Oklahoma State team uh, gives you confidence that not only they win this game, uh, but that they can go on, win the Big 12, uh, and, uh, and, and possibly get, earn themselves a spot in the playoffs? 
the veteran leadership is uh, is the thing that is going to come back to, I think, for them in uh, in a situation like this uh, with Bedlam. In a situation, if they if they win Bedlam, they've got to go on the road to Iowa State next week, uh, and uh, they you know they're unbeaten on the road right now, uh, which and they played some uh, some some tough games on the road. So um, that's uh, that's something that's going to be important to uh, to keep this team focused, keep them moving forward, uh, and and give themselves a shot to. Uh, to do all those things, you'll play for a Big 12 title, have a shot at getting in the uh, college football playoff. So, um, you know, the uh, the unique thing about them is that is that their best players are also their most grounded uh, and most uh, um, uh, most grounded leaders. They're the the guys that that are also bringing everybody back and saying, "Listen, we're playing good, but we can be better." And uh, they're they're not they're not going crazy and uh and and letting things get out of control so uh it works out well for them uh when you know when james washington is uh is is not not losing his mind on the sidelines because he's not getting thrown the ball enough (laughs) or or things like that so okay um that's uh that's a really important factor for them uh and it will be especially the next two weeks well what's uh mike gundy's situation uh with with this program uh is is he is he? Is, can you see Mike Gundy being here for like another ten years? I absolutely can. I think um, you know over over the last five uh, five years or so, he's he's had his run-ins with with Boone Pickens, the the school's big donor. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, Boone is, uh, is is his health isn't great, and so he's not as uh, as involved as he used to be. Um, and uh, and their relationship has has gotten better. He's had uh, had his issues with uh, with Mike Holder, but I think that uh, that they've they've uh, patched things up and they're doing fine now. Um, and I don't I really don't know how much longer Holder uh, wants to be uh, in his position. I think that he might be about done. Um, so I think that uh, um, you know that Gundy has uh, has it set up where he can probably coach here as long as he feels comfortable coaching here and decide, until he decides that he either doesn't want to coach or he uh, wants to go somewhere else. Um, I think that he's going to probably have that uh, uh, that ability at this point. Is he always going to be a college coach? That's a good question. He is, uh, you know, he doesn't talk a lot um, about about pro football. He, you know, he keeps up with uh, with his guys that have gone on. Um, I don't know if he would want to try his hand at the next level or not. You know, he's uh, he's never really uh, dealt with it a lot. You know, his uh, uh, his college coach Pat Jones. Uh, at Oklahoma State was a guy who went up to the NFL and had a uh, a pretty solid career after uh, after leaving Oklahoma State. Uh, you know, not as a head coach, but just as a position coach and things like that. Um, so it might be something that uh, that he becomes interested in uh, in experimenting with on down the line. Um, you know, right now he's got uh, he's got a, a high school sophomore and a, and a 13 year old son. Um, so maybe after uh, after they've gotten out of high school and uh, family situation is a little bit different. He starts uh, starts thinking about what uh, you know, what else out could be out there yeah. for uh, uh, for me to experiment with. What 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 what's been uh, the knock on Gundy for the fans? Uh, you know, you, you've been around this long, uh, like Gundy has. Uh, you're going to have your share of, of critics, and especially uh, usually it's one particular thing or a couple of particular things that fans just uh, oh you know he's doing that again or or oh you know he, if there's one thing that I'd like to see Mike Gundy be better at it's this. Uh, well, there's there's two things. I'll start with the off the field. There are there are there's a section of fans that get tired of the of the antics. Um, you know, I, I get, uh, I get all sorts of emails about, uh, why are they still talking about his hair? Uh, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So, um, so the, uh, the off the field stuff, uh, that, uh, that, that brings attention to Oklahoma state that could be positive attention, but uh-huh. there's, there's a section of fans that get tired of it on the field. Um, uh, a lot of fans get frustrated when he, uh, gets what they consider too conservative on offense. Okay. Um, they, uh, you know, especially this year, when uh, over the last over the last two weeks, when they've run the ball over 50 times a game, uh, they're just saying, you know, we, hey, we've got these six great wide receivers, these uh, these NFL prospects uh, catching the ball from another NFL prospect. Why are we not throwing the ball 50 times a game? And uh, you know, and I, I I don't necessarily agree with that no. that philosophy because it's uh, it's seeing what the defense is doing. It's uh, it's a pretty logical step to run the ball against them, but. 
Um, but that's uh, that's a criticism that often comes up. It's not just been the last two weeks. So um, they they feel like he gets uh, he gets too conservative in uh, in certain situations, and and that gets frustrating for them. Uh, before I let you go, did you like the uh, what you saw from the playoff polls, the uh, the first polls that are out? Anything there that I mean, I, I would think it's good for the Big Twelve that Oklahoma is ahead of Ohio State. Uh, maybe that showed a little bit of respect there for Oklahoma, uh, and 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 you have TCU in there, and Oklahoma State's at 11. So uh, and, and even have Iowa State as the first two loss team. So there seems to be some respect there for the Big 12. Yeah, exactly. And um, I like the, uh, the the philosophy that they uh, that they used. I think it was uh, it was it was it showed some uh, uh, some maturity, for lack of a better word, um, not to just say automatically say Alabama's number one. And uh, yeah. to, to look at the at the resumes and and see what they've done to this point as of right now, uh, with what everybody has accomplished, who is the best team? And I think that they did a good job of uh, of doing that. And that's uh, I think that's how Oklahoma ends up ahead of, of Ohio State, and uh, you know TCU and Oklahoma State being where they are. So yeah, I think that it uh, it showed uh, it, it definitely looked good for the Big Twelve, but I think it showed that uh, that this uh, this committee is. Uh, is going to handle things well uh, down the stretch, and uh, hopefully that uh, that turns out to be the case. Scott, I appreciate your time. Uh, enjoy the game tomorrow. Uh, best of luck the rest of the season, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again, hopefully sometime real soon. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That's Scott Wright, uh, Oklahoma State football writer uh, for the Oklahoman at NewsOK.com. And uh, just before that, Ryan Aber also from the Oklahoma and talking Oklahoma football. So we got the Bedlam uh, series all all wrapped up here on the network. And that's the game of the weekend. I mean, it is. Sorry, but it is. But there are a lot of good games this weekend. As I said at the very open of the show, we had the best weekend in college football last weekend. And it's followed up with a really good weekend. I mean, we, we, we've we talked about a couple of the big games because even Wake Forest, Notre Dame is a big game. It is. Now that Notre Dame is number three in the country and Wake has actually played pr- teams pretty tough. I mean, if you look at Wake, they've lost by 14 to Georgia Tech, 14 to Clemson, seven to Florida State. Then they beat Louisville. Now, again, the big problem is Dortch, who I think had four touchdowns last week, <clears throat> is out for the year. So that's a little bit of a problem there for Wake. But anyway, Elko, <clears throat> Elko. Uh, the defensive coordinator for Notre Dame, who was at Wake Forest, you know, so that that's a little interesting sidelight as well. Uh, but then you've got the other games. And let's go ahead and take a look. We've got Clemson and North Carolina State. And uh, by the way, before I move on, I might as well just tell you who I like in these games. I like Notre Dame. I'm going to go ahead and take Notre Dame minus the 14 against Wake Forest. I just think without Dorch, it's asking way too much for Wake. Notre Dame's on a nice roll. Not only have they co- uh, won six straight, they've covered six straight. That's, that means that they're uh, outperforming the expectations. That's what you want to see from a team. Uh, we, we picked them against USC and liked them. Uh, we like them again here. They're just they're just a different class. See, Wake um, – See, I, you know, again, I like Wake. Don't get me wrong. I just think the Dorch injury is just too big. I just do. And I'm not saying this game is going to be a blowout, but I can see I can see it being exactly like the North Carolina State game last week, you know, where it's it's a comfortable win going into the fourth quarter, uh, and yet it's not like some crazy blowout or anything like that. Uh, now I am going to take Oklahoma, and that's not a surprise, being Mr. Baker Mayfield fan now. Uh, last year, because hey, I'm, I'm on a nice run, or at least I'm on a nice two-year run. I'm trying to make it three years in a row with these quarterbacks. Three years ago, uh, two years ago was Dak Prescott. Last year was Deshaun Watson. So this year, Baker Mayfield is uh, is my newest uh, qu- uh, quarterback to like, and um, uh, and 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 of course, as I've said uh, a lot over the last week or two, he's the quarterback I want on the New York Jets. So uh, so I. You know, look, I, in, in some ways, it might even be better if if I actually want him with the Jets. It'd probably be better if he doesn't win this game, doesn't play in the playoffs, kind of everybody can forget about him. He slides down the draft boards because the other quarterbacks are going to outshine him in the workouts. Uh, oh, he does, Again, it just, just uh, like Ryan said, he doesn't have the strongest arm. He doesn't have the biggest body. Uh, and, 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 oh, maybe he's kind of a head case. Uh, and if Darnold comes out, Rosen comes out, and Allen comes out, maybe he's the fourth out of five quarterbacks. Uh, fine with me. 
But what if what if he plays in the playoffs? What if he does things and excites people and kind of brings back memories of Deshaun Watson? Hey, didn't they say kind of didn't they rip Deshaun Watson coming saying this and saying that and look how good he was? Uh, maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll overchoose Baker Mayfield. Uh, I don't want to see that. But anyway, uh, I don't think that'll happen. I, I, I if no matter how good Baker Mayfield were to play. Uh, if he gets to those workouts and has to match up against those other quarterbacks and those other quarterbacks are outshining him uh, with with size and arm strength and and, and character, uh, then uh, he's still going to be uh, he'll be one of those quarterbacks that a team like the, the New York Jets will be able to pick. OK, so uh, but anyway, throw that out of the equation. I, I just I think that you get into one of these games. I'm going to go with the uh, the quarterback that I think uh, can pull it out. I'm not sold that Mason Rudolph can do that. Uh, I'm not saying Mason Rudolph isn't a good quarterback. I've talked a lot uh, early in the season about Mason Rudolph, as you know. A lot of people were talking about the other guys, but I talked a lot about Mason Rudolph being somebody uh, that you shouldn't forget. Uh, so uh, I know how good he can be, uh, but I'm just a Baker Mayfield guy. So I'm going to say that. And I just think Oklahoma is a better team anyway. I think they proved that in their win against Ohio State. Uh, I know that they don't have a great defense. I get that, but neither does Oklahoma State. You know, this is one of those matchups where Oklahoma doesn't have to go, oh, yeah, that defense over there is better than ours. And since Oklahoma State doesn't have a better defense than Oklahoma, and Oklahoma has got a running game now to go along with Mayfield, you know, I'm sorry, but I just, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take Oklahoma in this spot, uh, getting two against the Cowboys. Okay, so uh, Clemson and North Carolina State. In that one, it's a seven-point spread. Uh, The Tigers have won five straight against the Wolfpack. Don't forget, last year they beat them in that overtime game. A lot of people thought that North Carolina State was going to win that game. And see, those were the types of games that Clemson was playing last year, which I think in part had a lot to do with the fact that people were just not – they weren't sold on Deshaun Watson because he would have these games where you'd go, what is he doing? Uh, and I think it was one of those situations, and we've, we've I've had other uh, analysts talk about it before, uh, is that he just I, – I think he just didn't get up for some games. That's it. That's all it was. But when he had to get up for a game and he had to do something special or he had to make sure he won a game like this, uh, like this North Carolina State game, but specifically those playoff games and championship games, uh, he, he showed you. So, But in this situation, Bryant's healthy. And that's important. Uh, look what happened when he got banged up. They lost to Syracuse. But as long as he plays, they're a better team. Uh, I told you before the Clemson lost to Syracuse that uh, I was hoping Clemson was going to lose a game uh, because then I can go ahead and take them to win the national championship as, as far as the futures were concerned because they were one of the co-favorites at that point. But uh, they dropped back down to like 10 to 1, I think, when we took them uh, last week. So that is much, much better. The defense is fantastic. I mean, this is a pro prospects dream game. I mean, Dan Shanka, I'm sure, is going to record this game and probably watch uh, film all night long. Uh, I mean, you take a look right now. I'm looking at the uh, the Arleds NFL Draft Preview brochure at Arleds.com. And uh, defensive ends, we have Bradley Chubb, of course, is the number one senior defensive end. Then we go to uh, Contavious Street, who's number seven. Then we go to uh, the top under class prospects for defensive end. Number two and number three are on Clemson. Uh, Colin Farrell, excuse me, Clellan, Colin Farrell, Clellan uh, Farrell and Austin Bryant. Then we go to defensive tackle. And Justin Jones is the seventh rated senior uh, defensive tackle. B.J. Hill, the 10th rated senior defensive tackle for NC State. And uh, then... Uh, we go to the top underclassmen, and uh, Christian Wilkins is the number two uh, top underclass prospect for defensive tackles. So that's how much talent there is, and that does not even include because uh, I, I think there was uh, wait because I think there are a couple other players. I, I don't think I know a couple other players that I want to throw in there as well, and that is you have Dexter Lawrence. Let's not forget about him. So Dexter Lawrence is only a sophomore, but uh, he is a very talented player, as is uh, Darian Roseboro. 
the defensive, uh, the junior defensive lineman for North Carolina State. So a lot of talent there up front for both teams. Uh, and I, I can't imagine this isn't going to be a good defensive battle. Uh, but uh, and, and I and I look, I said last week that I really felt that if North Carolina State was going to win one of these two games, that the best chance was going to be against Notre Dame, just because not 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 matchup wise, but just because of the way I feel about Clemson. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's out the window because that's only, you know, that sure. I mean, for, 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 for what I'm trying to do here and that's trying to pick a national champion. Uh, and by the way, I must say this, as far as another show and sport is concerned, we, we hit on Houston. So, uh, our futures worked for the Houston Astros in baseball. So we're very proud about that. Uh, but. Clemson, who was our who was uh, our our pick to win the national champion last year in the preseason, uh, and and now that we've got him again, that's that's the thing for me is that I just I'm looking at a team that I think can win the national championship, definitely be a playoff team, sitting there right now top four, but if they lose, they're done. I don't I don't I don't I don't think that that's going to happen, but this. Look, Hines is playing. That's a huge lift for NC State. Again, he got hurt last week, didn't play the rest of the game. Now, I don't know if he's going to wind up playing the whole game. And who knows? It's college football. We have no idea if these guys are going to play. This isn't like the NFL injury reports. Uh, but I, I, I look, this the seven points is definitely a concern for me because I could see this game being close. Uh, that's the only thing I'm a little bit bothered by. Um, I can't tell you right now at this moment if I would take the game. Just can't tell you. So right now I'm not going to, but I do like Clemson to win the game. And you know what? Maybe they win the game pretty much like last year, very close game. Ohio State and Iowa, uh, also a 3:30 game. Now remember we talked about this on Monday uh, about the fact that you know stop. There, there were several reasons why that I didn't think that uh, any of these analysts, including the ESPN boys, should be anointing Ohio State in the playoffs and Penn State out just because of one game. Um, I still believe that as long, and, and even the guys that were talking on ESPN about the playoffs uh, the other night, I think Herb Street said that if Penn State's going to get to the playoffs, they're going to have to blow out everybody. The only way they're going to get in, because, and, and see, they're already doing it. I don't know if you noticed it, but I'm already hearing the analysts talk about, well, See, the difference between Penn State running the table, Ohio State losing another game, and and then and then and then having a reverse situation happen where Penn State doesn't go and win the Big Ten championship, but they're rate ranked ahead of Ohio State, and then Ohio State winds up uh getting shafted and Penn State goes to the to the playoffs, like what happened to Penn State last year. So could it happen to Ohio State this year? Uh if they lose one of these games, Iowa, Michigan State, or Michigan, yet still win the Big Ten championship, uh, well, I think it was Kirk Herbstreit says, well, the big difference is is that Ohio State beat Oklahoma last year. That's the big difference. So, no, that that can't happen. The only way is is Ohio State's going to have to, Penn State's going to have to win every game the rest of the season. And they have to blow out everybody the rest of the season, I should say. That's all. That that's it. That's that's, that's the only way it's going to happen. Okay, and. See, this is what's called selective selective analysis. You know, this is what I want to, because I am a Ohio State homer or just a big program homer, which a lot of these a lot of these analysts are in the industry. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. Um, and I mean, I, I had to hear it again about Alabama. I mean, one of the guys that's been around for a long time on ESPN, I mean, it's the same guy that thought it was laughable that Penn State should be chosen of Ohio State last year as far as the playoffs were concerned. Yeah, yeah. How'd that turn out, huh? Yeah. How'd that turn out for Ohio State? You know, so some of these guys have backed Ohio State last year, and then they got murdered by Clemson, deservedly so, because they didn't deserve it, okay? Because they weren't better. Uh, and then, so... I'm going to so so I'm going to hear these people talking about how oh it's just ridiculous that Georgia was I mean how can you say Georgia's ranked ahead of Alabama? How can you say that? I mean just a look out. It's the same Alabama this Alabama that from some of these from some of these lifers. 
Some of these guys that have been doing this for so long uh, that they, they've, they've just got this, uh, this thing inside of them that Alabama's God. You know, like they should be the, the look, it, it's like the Patriots in the NFL. But you know what? The Patriots don't win the Super Bowl every year. Matter of fact, the Saints don't win the Super Bowl. I mean, the Patriots have been doing this now with Brady and Belichick for what, 20 years? Something like that. I mean, this has been going on for a very long time. I mean, seriously, what has it been going on for 18 years? I don't know. Now they have six Super Bowls, but still, that's what, one every three years, something like that? Okay, so yes, they deserve the credit. Yes, they're great, at, and they're the best in our era or in our 10 years or whatever. You know, you want to say the Nick Saban era. I get that. But you can't blindly, you know, it, 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 it's, that's what it is. It's just blind recognition about the program. And, and what? oh, well, you got to look at when they were ranked. You got to look at when Florida State was ranked. All right, so, so wait, wait, wait. You're trying to tell me because one guy – one guy gets hurt, the quarterback, just one. And I understand he's an important part, but has anybody seen that offensive line for Florida State this year? Has anybody seen their running game this year? That is not a good football team. They are not. Francois, it would not have made that big a difference. Now, would they have won a couple more games? Of course they would have. Absolutely. They wouldn't be this bad. But that's not what we're talking about. See, they're trying to tell you that with Francois quarterback, oh, they were, they were, look at how highly ranked they were, and they were a really good team at the time. Yeah, well, okay, what, I don't understand, what, what is that for? Again, that's selective analysis. That's like the Ohio State, Oklahoma thing. Well, Oklahoma, uh, uh, you know, um, even though they beat them, uh, Ohio State is a better team now, so because of that, uh, they should be ranked ahead of them. All right, well, how do you penalize Oklahoma for that, though? So Oklahoma goes to Ohio State, beats them, and, and not, no, nobody's debating it. Ohio State's not better now. Of course they're better. But I don't know how you penalize Oklahoma for it. Well, they lost to Iowa State. Yeah, but Iowa State beat T TCU, too. What, what are we going to – we're ripping now Iowa State? But this goes back to what I've said for years. This is why the, this, the, the fact that we have to pick and choose and slam and criticize and, 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 uh, and, and try to find these little holes uh, about why teams are better than other teams. And, hey, if you've got two losses and the other team has one loss, well, that two-loss team can't overtake that one-loss team and all this other stuff. And head-to-head, and -head, hey, that means everything. And the next year, the head-to-head -head don't mean anything. And uh, it all depends when the head-to-head -head is. And. It drives you crazy. You know, and then you got to hear some people saying, well, that's what's great about the system is that you got the debate and we can all kind of talk about it. And that's that's what college, that's why it's so popular. That's that's what that's why it's popular, because we get to pull our hair out every week and talk about it. This isn't one of those conversations that we're having all the time. That's fun. This isn't fun for me. It's not fun for me to constantly see teams get chosen over other teams that I don't believe that they should be. Everybody's got a different opinion, and I'm okay with that. I'm not always right. They're not always right, and you're not always right. That's the problem with the system is we're never always right. So how do you rectify it? You let them play on the field. That's what we want. We don't want to talk. I mean, especially look, look. So, so I mean, because all you got to do is, it, and, and I've, I've said this before with Alabama. See, as good as they are, just take a look at the schedule. Okay, who have they played? Fresno State, Colorado State, Vanderbilt, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, and the only. Two teams with a pulse they've beaten all year were Texas A&M and Florida State. And Texas A&M is not a top team, and they won that game by eight. And for Florida State, I just we just we just went over that. I mean, talk about a Florida State team that loses by thirty-five to three to Boston College. I mean, they've lost three out of four. 
They're at this rate, they're not even going to a bowl game. They they actually should have lost the Wake Forest game. I mean, really, the only game they've won all year that you'd say, okay, yeah, I guess they won that game was the Duke game. That's it. That's all. I'm sorry, but Francois would not have made that much of a difference. Would would they be a uh, whatever they are? Let's just say would they be five and two or something? Okay, yeah, I'm all right with that. But what is that? That doesn't get you anywhere. That's not you're not in the what are you ranked now? Fifteenth, eighteenth, and that's supposed to be some special team that Alabama played. So they didn't play anybody. But oh, how can you put Georgia over Alabama? That's just they're just trying to be cute. The committee is just trying to be smart. They're trying to they're trying to outsmart you. Because how can you not think Alabama is the best team? Well, probably because Georgia beat Notre Dame at Notre Dame. And you know where Notre Dame sits right now? Third. Georgia beat the third ranked playoff team in Notre Dame. Alabama hasn't done that. Now, can Georgia's schedule be better? Sure. But that's the whole SEC thing, too. I mean, I didn't even have to get me started on the SEC. The SEC is still a great conference, but the SEC, this is not the SEC from 10 years ago. I mean, just take a look at it. You've got Ole Miss on suspension. You have Auburn. And I don't want to hear about Auburn's chances. I mean, I only explained Auburn's chances myself on Monday. I've said this for two weeks now. And now we're finally hearing hearing about it. I've said it for two weeks about the fact that even Auburn has a chance to, for the national championship because they get to play Georgia. Uh, they play Alabama. Uh, it, they could wind up going to the SEC championship game if they win that. What if they beat Alabama and then beat Georgia twice? How do you keep them all out of the playoffs? You can't. But here's the he, that's all I was doing was explaining that they're that they're mathematically in it. But you know what? See, unlike what I heard, oh, but watch out for Auburn, this or that. There is no way, no way that Jared Stidham has any sort of ability whatsoever to beat Georgia and Alabama. None. And you'll find that out. Did, did anybody watch the LSU game? How they blew that? So this is not a – I mean, look, if they had a really good quarterback, then they're a national championship contender, but they just don't. That's a big weakness for them. LSU doesn't have a quarterback. Florida doesn't have a quarterback. Texas A&M is down. Arkansas is awful. Mississippi can't even beat Arkansas. I mean, and, and they're in a fog because of, uh, of, of the – uh are being suspended. I mean, Mississippi State, they're, they're having a pretty good year. That That's a pretty good team. And you know what? They will host Alabama next week. I like that game. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and say that's not a bad. That's a very, that might be the best game Alabama plays all year. The best team that they play all year at that point. It's going to be better than LSU they play this week. Florida's so bad they fired their coach. Butch Jones is going to be fired. How does he not get fired? All right. Well, Muschamp's doing a nice job this year, but it's just an average team. They're, you know, they're, they're, this is a good team. But, I mean, it's, that's, you know, it's it's just an okay SEC team. And Kentucky is just okay. That's it. And uh, Missouri is just, all right. Well, that's it. This is the SEC. There's nothing spectacular about the SEC right now. So I, I don't get this why I'm going to sit there and praise Alabama like they're some god team when they haven't played anybody and they're in a conference that is just okay. There, there's, there's nothing that tells me that the SEC is a better conference right now than, say, the Big Ten. The Big Ten gives you Penn State, Ohio State, and Wisconsin. And you still have to play Michigan in their defense. You know, even Michigan is Michigan State's overachieved with their defense. And there's a couple other decent teams there. You could say SEC, Big Ten, equal. But there's no way the SEC is better. 
And then even, you know, so, so there, there are the, the, the landscape of college football has changed dramatically in the last few years. I mean, just look at last year with Alabama. Last year, Alabama went undefeated, but was it a surprise? Was it a surprise when they did it? No. You know why? Because they didn't play anybody. Last year, remember when they played USC in that game? That wasn't Sam Darnold. That was Max Brown. He was so bad that he was gone. And you take a look at, don't forget that Mississippi game, the third game of the season. They were, remember they were trailing that game by like whatever. That, was, that game was like a two score Mississippi lead. And then they had that big play, that turning point where, uh, what was it? I forget what happened. It was like a turnover or something. And Mississippi, they called Mississippi for some sort of personal foul. And it, and, and this, ever since that moment or something, everything changed. And then Alabama just uh, took off and so forth. And, but it wasn't like it was a blowout. They only won the game by five. They gave up 43 points against Mississippi last year. And LSU wasn't a very good team last year. And don't forget Auburn, Sean White, who was playing really well, got hurt. He didn't play in that game. And they play Florida in the SEC Championship game for the second straight year, and Florida has no quarterback for the second straight year. Because remember, they lost to Mississippi in 2015. I'm telling you, this is a good team. It's a good program. It's just like Ohio State. To me, Alabama, Ohio State, it's the same thing every year. Actually, I, 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 I mean, I, all they have to do is, which I do applaud them for matching up in these big games early. That's what they have to do. Because if they didn't, they, they wouldn't have anybody on their schedule. And and I really applaud Ohio State for, for because Ohio State hadn't done something like this in years. The, the Oklahoma home and home that we saw the last two years, that's the first time Ohio State's done anything like that in a while. Sure, they would have the Virginia Techs and so forth, and but they didn't never play these games, these big games early. So I do ap applaud them for putting it together and having the guts to do it. And as much as I like Ohio State, uh, as far as what they did last week and, and what JT Barrett did, this is not going to be easy for them to go into Iowa this week and win. Uh, again, Iowa lost by two to Penn State. I mentioned as a 13-point home dog this year on a last-second play by Penn State. They beat Michigan last year by one as a 21-point point dog, both games at home. Uh, so, uh, so Ohio State, they're favored by – I forget what they're favored by in this game. What are they favorite by in this game, Ohio State? Let me see here. Should be a pretty substantial spread. It is 16 and a half. I don't know which I I don't know what I would take there. I might actually go with Iowa in that one. It all depends. If well, let's just put it this way. If Iowa plays a really good game, like they play their best game, you know, they, they don't do anything stupid, give Ohio State any easy scores, anything like that. I think Iowa can definitely be there at the end. I think they've got enough talent. Uh, when, when, uh, in other words, th what they've done to, to, to in the two games I mentioned, to me there would be no difference. It wouldn't be like, oh my god, they, yeah, but that's that's that, that's Michigan, that's Penn State, but this is Ohio. I mean, there's no difference. So I can see it happening. I really can. And if Ohio State is truly gonna be the team to beat now, and forget it, they're gonna steamroll everybody then th they should win this game easily because considering what they did last week to Penn state and the emotion and having to now go on the road. Remember I just talked about that before. Now they're going to go on the road. Uh, and then, and then again, don't forget to what we talked about. They play Michigan state after that at home and Michigan state has had their share of wins against Ohio state over the years. Last year, Ohio state beat Michigan state by one, uh, 2015 Michigan state won by three. 2014, uh, Ohio State won by 12. Uh, before that, uh, it was Michigan State winning the Big Ten Championship game by 10. And in 2012, it was Ohio State winning by one. And the road team had actually, and the dog, had actually won more games in that series recently. So I'm sorry, that game, no matter where it is, even though it's in Columbus, is not going to be easy. 
And now that thankfully Michigan has turned to Peters, Brandon Peters, now watch out for Michigan because that's been the only thing holding this team back this year. Now they're still young. Okay, offensively, they're not where they need to be because they still have a lot of young skill position players. But they have now they have a shot against Ohio State. Now they have a shot because of Peters. Because he'll get an opportunity to play for a few games, get himself ready to go for that one. But it just we'll see. I mean, we'll find out. Could it could it, look JT Barrett played great, but as I mentioned on Monday, was it a great game? See, that's just something you have to remember. That was not a great game as far as was it a great result? Yes. Fantastic. Was it a great game as far as the way the game was played? No. It was ugly. There were, what, 20 penalties? Uh, both teams making mistakes on special teams. Both teams you know, letting their offense down, even though they scored a bunch of points at key times. Not doing this, not doing that. I'm telling you, it was an ugly game in that respect, but it was an exciting game for the fans. I'm sorry. I am not getting carried away with Ohio State the way everyone else does. I need to see a little bit more proof. That doesn't mean they're not going to be good or better or that they're not better than earlier this year. But I'm not going crazy. I'm just not. And, and, and so we'll see. But I, I think this could this game could be close. You know, we'll we'll see. Iowa though has got to play good football, and they've got a good defense. Don't forget, we've talked a lot about a couple of their uh, defenders on this team. Both uh, uh, actually, you know, the top guy is Jewel, the linebacker, Josie Jewel. Matter of fact, uh, Jewel, being a senior, he is where is he? He's the sixth rated our lads inside linebacker prospect for the draft. So he's 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 the big guy on defense for Iowa. I mean, Stanley has played pretty well at times, a quarterback. Wadley's a good running back. You know, they've got uh, Vandenberg, a receiver. They're always going to do pretty good on offensive line, but it's that defense. The defense is going to have to play big. And, and because Penn State's defense was not good. I'm sorry, but that Penn State defense was pretty bad last week. So I expect Iowa defense to be a lot better than Penn State's. But Iowa doesn't have the offense Penn State does either. And Ohio State's beaten Iowa five straight times, but even though they haven't played, though, and that's important since 2013. But the last three games when in the series between those two teams actually was decided by 10 points or less. LSU-Alabama. Alabama's won six straight in the series, but LSU has been uh, playing a lot better. Uh, and uh, they've won three straight. They had that close win against Florida. Uh, they had that miraculous win against Auburn, and then they blew out Mississippi, and, and Geis is the big de facto guy here. Problem is, every time I've seen – I mean, we saw it with Fournette. I mean, Alabama, that, or at least those defenses, were able to shut down Fournette and make LSU throw the football. And that's the reason why we're probably not going to see LSU put up much points because with Alabama's defense, as long as they do shut down Geis, LSU's not going to throw the ball much. And the only way that this game is going to be close, they're going to have to win the turnover battle, and LSU's defense is going to have to step it up. I mean, they do have some good players. Arden Key uh, is uh, one of the top defenders on their team. He, you know, the guys like that are going to have to come up big for LSU. 21-point spread for Alabama, that's a big number, uh, no question. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I might take LSU in that one with the points, but this is not where Alabama is going to lose. No way. If Alabama is going to lose uh, this season, it's going to be either at Mississippi State next week or at Auburn at the end of the season. And I would, I would, I would actually believe they have a better chance of losing next week than Auburn. Sorry, I just don't think Jared Stidham has what it takes to win a big game. And Virginia Tech and Miami. Miami is uh, this is almost a pick'em game. Uh, Virginia Tech won last year by 21. Uh, uh, their only loss this season was to Clemson by 14. Uh, look, Miami. Uh, I'm, I'm, I kind of like Virginia Tech in this one, but uh, I mean, I shouldn't really say I, I really like Virginia Tech in this one. I, I just, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure how good Miami is. Let's just put it that way. But the thing is, is I don't know if Virginia Tech is the team to take advantage of it. See, I, I don't, I'm not the type of person that falls for all these blowout wins. You can, you can tell. 
I mean, I've seen Alabama blow out teams all the time and Ohio State blow out teams all the time. They don't win championships every year. OK, so but they still blow out teams all the time. Uh, it's overrated. I used to see Florida State blow out teams all the time with Bobby Bowden. He didn't win championships every year. So I, I just I, I don't so I don't fall for that. Uh, so winning games, all that matters. And 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 it's, I'd rather have Miami win all these close games in a situation where we might have a close game because they know how to win the close games. So I, I would feel better about that than Virginia Tech, who, if you look at it, uh, the closest game they've been in all year uh, was the first game of the season, and they beat West Virginia by seven. Then after that, they lost by Clemson to 14, as I mentioned. And and they did beat Boston College by 13. This is a good team. Fuente's doing a good job. Joshua Jackson's a nice quarterback. He's got a lot of talent. So th- this is a good team. Now, how good are they? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. This is a good opportunity to find out. They're going to be at, v- at Georgia Tech next week, and that's not going to be easy for Virginia Tech because they're going to have to rebound and short week to prepare for that triple option offense. That's not ideal. And then back-to-back road games, including coming off a big game against Miami. And even the Virginia game won't be easy at the end of the month because Mendenhall's got Virginia playing better football this year. Uh but I, I mean, I, I tell you the truth, I'll, I'll take Miami. I really will. I think the thing that, that one of the reasons I like Miami in this one is because it is a pick 'em game, pretty much. So because of that, they're at home. I'll take them. I don't think they're getting any respect. Uh, I, I think if they would have blew, I think if they blew out North Carolina last week, uh, they, they, maybe Miami would be a three-point favorite here. But because they struggled to win that game. I think people are going, yeah, but Miami, they've only won the last four games by a total of 18 points. They're not blowing out everybody. They couldn't even blow out North Carolina. This is going to catch up to them. And you know what? Maybe they're right. Okay. But I just think, again, that when you have a team that has found ways to win, I'd rather have that team in this spot. So I'll take Miami to win this game. But I'm not very excited about it. And and as we said before, wow, because I don't think anybody's talking about it as much as they should be. And maybe that's because of the fact that it's really catching up to them. They're getting blindsided by it. But we could have ourselves a a just a, a tremendous Miami Notre Dame game next year, next week. That could be huge, huge. I mean, even if Miami loses, it'll be huge because both teams could be you know with one loss. And then the other big game is Arizona USC because this game will determine uh, more than likely who is going to play uh, in the uh, Pac-12 uh, championship. So USC, um, I mean, they beat Arizona State last week. We know Colorado and Utah aren't playing well. We know UCLA isn't playing well. So this is it. Even though there's still a few weeks to go, but this is it. You know, we've been on the Khalil Tate bandwagon, as you know, uh, since the Colorado game. And we've been uh, backing Arizona every single week, beating UCLA by 17, winning an overtime against Cal, and trouncing Washington State last week. A lot of people thought that that would be the end of the road. Nope. 58 points beat Washington State. But this is it now. See, the problem for Arizona, though, is three out of the next four are on the road. And so it's not going to be very easy for them. But this gives them the shot. Now, they've already got the one loss at home, in the conference. That was against Utah. And USC's got the one loss. That, of course, was the one uh, against Washington State. You know, the funny thing is, is you would think USC's got like eight losses because of how disappointing they've been. But it's just because they haven't won games as easily as we all thought they were. But they've only lost a couple of games, and and one of them was on national TV, you know, the Washington State game, I, you know, on that Friday night. But the other one was getting trounced by Notre Dame. Uh, no, uh, USC is what are they favored in this game by? USC is favored by seven and a half. Well, I'm taking Arizona. I don't know if they're going to win this game. This is like one of those games that I always say uh, I'm going to take because uh, I think it can go either way, um, and uh, I'll take the dog. 
So I'll take Arizona. Why wouldn't I take Arizona? Like I said, I've taken them every week since Tate's been there. They've won and covered for me. Um, actually, they've won um, twice, uh, covered twice for me. Uh, but they've won each game. And I'll just, I'll just go with them. They're a dog now, an eight-point dog. So why not? I'll take Arizona in this one and see if USC can stop them. Still not sold that Clay Helton is going to wind up being the guy. We'll see. But, you know, look, it would be better for college football because look, I think this is it for USC. If they win, if they win this game, they're going to run the table and then they are going to wind up playing in the Pac-12 championship game. And at this point, it's it's looking like we're going to see probably Washington. Well, you know what? It'll be the winner of next Friday's game. Because next Friday, it's Stanford at home against Washington. So that will uh, determine uh, who will play USC. And USC's already beaten Stanford, didn't play Washington. So we'll see. You know, it'll be one of those games. But, uh, you know, does USC have enough time at, at this point in the season to, to get hot again and to be relevant? You know, maybe they end up number six in the poll. Uh, playing great like they did at the end of the last season, beat Washington or Stanford in the Pac-12 championship game, uh, go to the Rose Bowl, who knows? Uh, yeah, sure, they can do that. They've got the talent. But first things first, uh, see if you can beat uh, Khalil Tate in Arizona this week. All right, and then, uh, I, I, again, the other games uh, of note, uh, the ones that you want to keep an eye on, uh, I'm very surprised that Wisconsin's only a nine-point favorite at Indiana this week. I mean, really? Why would they only be a nine-point favorite? No respect for Wisconsin. Penn State's a seven-point favorite at Michigan State. Uh, no way do I think they're going to lose that game. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be all over Penn State in that one. Not that I think they're going to blow them out or anything like that. Uh, but again, I, I just think, why wouldn't I take Wisconsin and Penn State in those games? You know, the spreads are very low. Uh, I like Missouri against Florida. I like the way, you know, Barry Odom, he's got that team playing well again. You know, uh, I thought that was the end of the road for Barry Odom about a month ago. And now Missouri is playing some good football. Now, they're, they haven't played a lot of good teams. And that, this isn't even a good team right now, Florida. Uh, and, and anything can happen when you, when you get rid of a coach. Look at Oregon State. Oregon State's actually playing good football the last couple of games. They still haven't won, but they're playing well. I mean, they've, they've lost their last two games by like, what, two points, three points or something. Uh, so uh, so I can see Florida putting up a fight this week, but I like the way Missouri's playing. Uh, by the way, Auburn's a Texas A&M favorite by 15, uh, but Texas A&M played their worst game of the season last week, so I don't know what to expect from them. Uh, let's see, what else? What other games uh, of note are there? Uh, Syracuse at Florida State. Why would I not take Syracuse in that game? Syracuse is better right now. They are better. Period. End of story. This is just name recognition. That's all. I'm sorry. Has anybody watched Florida State play? Did you watch the Boston College game last week? Syracuse is better. So I'll take Syracuse. Uh, let's see. What else is there? Uh, let's take a look. North Texas at Louisiana Tech is a big game for uh, Conference USA. Uh, FAU, that game is getting underway in a couple hours. Uh, so uh, they're taking on Marshall. That's a big game uh, for Lane Kiffin in the program. George is a big favorite over, over South Carolina. Uh, let's see. Uh, by the way, Iowa State's getting uh, three points at West Virginia. I'll take Iowa State. Why wouldn't I, the way they're playing? But yeah, that's a tricky game coming off uh, the big win last week. Just They're just a better team than West Virginia this season, but, you know, not sure exactly what that means in that game. Uh, Stanford at Washington. Washington, excuse me, Washington State's favorite by two. Uh, as long as Love plays, I like Stanford in that one. I think Washington State, I mean, the whole thing with Luke Falk getting benched last week and all the turnovers from the backup quarterback. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Things have fallen apart real fast for the Cougars. Uh, so I like Stanford in that one. Let's see. What else? Uh, I think Josh Allen gets uh, get, gets a good win on Saturday night. All of a sudden, Colorado State's falling apart. Remember, we talked about this last week. And then he lost. They lost to Air Force. So uh, I'll, I'll take Josh Allen on Saturday night against Colorado State as a three-point dog. Uh, TCU's a seven-and-a-half-point favorite at home against Texas. And um, I don't know. That's that's uh, Texas has been they, – they've – look. Herman's going to turn that program around, period. 
Uh, I'll take Texas in that one. Sure. They, you know, they haven't won every game, but you know what? They've covered a heck of a lot of games. Central Florida's at SMU. That's a big game in that uh, in that uh, AAC. So don't forget, Central Florida's still uh, undefeated. Uh, Minnesota's at Michigan. Uh, let's see. You know, Southern Miss uh, might upset Tennessee this week. And maybe that'll finally be the 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 camel that breaks the uh, the the straw of Butch Jones, and he's done. I can see that happening. All right, and uh, that'll do it. So uh, let's uh, want, uh, we just want to recap and uh, thank our special guests uh, for joining us: Mike Frank, publisher of uh, Irish Sports Daily. Definitely thank him. Uh, Great job by these guys. Uh, so if you're a big Notre Dame fan looking for a place to go, irishsportsdaily.com. That's for all Notre Dame sports. Also, Ryan Aber and Scott Wright from the Oklahoma at newsok.com. Thank them for joining us. If you're an NFL fan, check out On Demand. We have our Week 9 NFL preview that's available. Tony and I went over all the games in the NFL for this weekend. Uh, best depth charts in the biz, rlads.com for both NFL college football. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at PrimeSN. We'll see you next time. Is in blue, a transmissions will resume. Now try to push trucks and keep us all down and down. And hope that we will never see the truth around.